Yo, fire tribe. There is a story of the um, Ark of the Covenant goes through into the New Testament in, into Edessa. Um, <clears throat> so this is, is a part of my New Testament studies um, where we see the Ark of the Covenant coming into that story via the history of the sacred stone of Egypt, which was the Ben-Ben stone, which was the Ben-Ben stone. It's Jacob's pillow as well, which I've recently translated as being um, a Ben-Ben stone, exactly the same. The story of the Red Man. Yes, uh, well, we get that mostly from Irish history. I go into a, a, it a little bit, but it's very fragmentary their history it's very it reads more mythical than scotty chronicon does um so it's difficult to get real information about it they have the story of the red hand in irish history which became the flag of northern ireland the red, 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 red. and that comes out of very ancient history uh, the Nabor Gabala, I think it is. And note the red hand is inside a um, Star of David as well, because it's connected with the Exodus. And that's the flag of Northern Ireland, still is. Well, they equate the arrival of the um, Irish with the Exodus story. So, oh, so the so Seal of Solomon in there as well. Yeah, they link it up wow. with, the, um, uh, with the Star of David of, of the Israelites part of this sort of lost Israelite story that you have. But the other place we find the symbolism of the red hand is at Amarna with Akhenaten. So Akhenaten is giving out all of these uh, awards to I, uh, Commander I as he was then, which are all of these golden talks, these necklaces he was giving out. And, but one of the things he gives to I is a pair of red gloves. And of course, the, the volcano itself was a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. And it did cause a tsunami because it was a maritime uh, earthquake and volcano. Uh, and of course it would part the waters as we've seen you know with the Indonesian um, tsunami the first thing that happens with the tsunami especially um, a, a, a subduction tsunami which is a, a subduction uh, volcano from the ashes. We've made it. We have made it through another day. The passing of a full moon and cancer that was absolutely wild and amazing, and I hope everybody had some good experiences with that. We are on our second episode in ancient Ireland, ancient Celtic, the Tuatha de Danan, and today we are getting in to some goodness with our guest Ralph Ellis, prolific author, so much beautiful research, awesome insight. Unfortunately, I um, am in a McMinniman's Hotel lobby, uh, not a lobby, I'm in the cafe and what have you, um, so my audio during the interview is un unfortunately terrible, and I uh, stay muted often. Um, but luckily Dan is there to absolutely hold this great conversation down, sounding great. So without further ado, very excited to get into this with you. But before we do that, aren't you excited about the good old house cleaning and what in which we must address? Here we are. Here we are. My friends, my, my amazing friends. Join us on the Telegram group chat. We just, just, just reached 200 people on that group chat. And 
it is such a beautiful, harmonious family in which we can share a bunch of great information with each other, songs, books. You can even upload an entire movie to it if, if, if you so choose to do so. It's fine. It's dandy. There's a bunch of other groups that um, you can also find on that. I, uh, you have our other podcast friends who have Telegram group chats. If you don't have the app, what are you doing? If you do have the app and you don't have us on there, what are you doing? In general, what are you doing? Uh, th- this is an actual inquiry. What are you doing right now? <sighs> Hope you're breathing and feeling good and allowing all of the stresses to melt away. That's what we are here to do on Rising from the Ashes podcast. (laughs) My friends, if you would like to support Dan and I on this venture of research, of truth seeking, of finding alchemical and antiquated answers, if you want to support us, there are a couple ways to do so. You can join the Patreon where fresh content is being uploaded weekly for $3 a month. Great, great, great benefit on that. Helps us out. You get some content in the meantime. It's a fantastic way to engage and get even some more Rising from the Ashes, which we know you need in your life. All right. And another great way to support us is, of course, buying a t-shirt, a mug, a backpack, a yoga mat, or something upon our merch store. Go and check it out. The link is just right below me here. Boop. Right there, you see, oh, that's right, this is audio. Yeah, it's in the show notes. You can go and check out the merch store. Uh, A bunch of cool stuff on there, some designs that we put together. Uh, Check it out, let us know what you like. My friends, definitely, 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 if you haven't gotten some psychic or clairvoyant work from my friend Sabaya Sogard over at Vision Switch, geez louise, I hope you're getting it somewhere else. I hope you're getting your psychic hygiene involved in your regimen some way somehow and i know life is busy i know life is life so things come up things happen this is something that you're not going to regret by any means working with sabaya has given me a lot of insight and the more consistently that i do work with her um saturdays by the way is when we have our little dates (laughs) um I just feel I feel mag- magnetically great afterwards. Like I feel energetically super good, um, especially when we do like um, like a chakra healing session. Um, and she paints beautiful pictures as to what is coming up in her intuitive intuitive visions. And past life readings are always incredible. I try to do those seldomly as they are very potent uh, and will bring tears to your eyes. So be ready for that. And well. You know, crying is in a beautiful detox, my friends, so it is absolutely necessary. And that is coming at you with a discount. She's offering the Fire Tribe a discount. If you go to that in the show notes, visionswitch.space, just send her an email, tell us that we sent you. You'll get along, you'll get you'll get patted on the back down the journey of healing and understanding because life is not linear life is so vast and there's so much to be had and so allow your uh, vessel to be more receptive by getting rid of outsiders energies and being more aligned to your own it's really great so go ahead and do that my friends uh, I think we're here. I think we made it. We are going to divert right into some RFTA news. Today we have Michelle from Michelle's Healing Home to talk to us about some of our favorite herbs, St. John's Wort. And let me tell you what, I know we've had a few different herbologists here coming on for the news segments. I tried. It was a sad attempt at, you know, thinking I know what the fuck I'm talking about. Eh. Anyways, Michelle is awesome. She is really great and you will tell by this conversation that she is definitely our in-house herbalist at this point because she knows her stuff and we had a great time talking with her so i hope you enjoy and it's a long one i won't lie it's a pretty long news piece um before we get into the uh the conversation with Ralph Ellis, but there's a lot to chew on there. So make sure to give us your feedback on what you think of the new segments um, and how you enjoyed it. Please give us an email with any questions or concerns or guest recommendations or an area or a rabbit hole that you want us to theme our months to be. 
Go ahead and email us any of those questions. We'd love to hear from you. Shout out to everybody who has used that email and reached out to us. You know who you are. Thank you so much. Um, it's always a pleasure. It's an honor to be here with you guys in this space, in the podcast space, in the research space. Dan and I have so much gratitude for you guys at the bottom of our hearts. So without further ado, let's get into some RFTA news. Fire tribe, what's happening? What's up? Dan, Knocky Dan. Homie Romy Hello, here. Homie Romy. Hello. AKA Gator. AKA I don't know. Child of Vendor. Uh soft AKA, boiled egg man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the boy of blunder. <laughs> the boy of blunder. Uh yo, what's happening, Dan? We're back at it again with a real, an actual real RFTA news segment. Sorry to leave you guys hanging. I yes. know you guys hate listening to me to me read for 20 minutes sometimes 35 minutes uh some of you love it and for those of you but i know who that i know who doesn't i know who you are and uh it's okay we'll work on that kidding uh but yeah we're back at it again with some goodness and one of the og topics that we always have been getting into since the beginning of the show and that's um that's herbalism because we love plants so uh who do we have with us today dan who is this human uh, we are here today with Michelle from Michelle's Healing Home. Uh, some of you may know who she is already. Uh, if you don't, uh, are you married or is it your boyfriend? He's uh, my boyfriend. Too? We may okay. as well be married. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm so over calling him my boyfriend. Because Where's the ring, like... Mario? Where's the yeah. ring? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, he sounds like his mom. <laughs> <laughs> and our whole fa- all of our family members but yeah. my my mom this yep. weekend alone i was just talking to a bartender that we were at this just place just getting one of our favorite beers together my mother and i and i was just simply conversing with this woman she's like oh and i was like stop <laughs> it she's like i need grandchildren and i'm like no just please leave me alone please leave me alone <laughs> mothers man am i right oh, oh goodness it's for real, baby gators baby gators <laughs> Infest in the water. It's easy to put to sleep, though. You just put them on their back and then rub their belly and then night night. It is that easy. It is that. It's a simple. (laughs) We're, you know, we're simple creatures. (laughs) Yeah, totally. (laughs) All bite, no bark. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. So, yeah, happy to be here, guys. I'm so excited. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. Dude, okay. Well, uh, Maybe for the people that don't know uh, you and this other human in, in which we were referencing, uh, Mario, uh, but can you tell us about you and, and your your herbal journey? Like, what what's what's your deal, Michelle? How did you get here? <laughs> Never say what's your deal. To <laughs> yeah, what's your here. deal, man? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what's your deal? <laughs> tell us what your deal great, is. That's great. That's great. I love it. Um, <laughs> No, so my deal uh, as an herbalist, um, I started studying and getting interested into plants probably around 2013 or so it was. Uh, That was my first introduction. I'm not one of those herbalists who was like raised with it. I didn't have hippie parents. I, you know, I had a pretty typical upbringing like lots of people do. But I kind of, I feel like, so I moved to Portland in 2008 and it was in Portland, Oregon where I really found herbalism and sometimes I think like the plants pulled me here in some way because once I moved to this region I mean I'm originally from Wisconsin so flatland farmland whatever and coming out to the Pacific Northwest like I was my mind was blown I just was seeing mountains and valleys and gorges and all this stuff and I knew I was going to be here in this area forever at least for this portion of forever for me right now right and so anyway I kind of feel like the plants pulled me out here because once I started studying herbalism I was just like dude this is where I'm supposed to be my comfort zone is with the plants and in the forest and working with them, specifically making medicine um, and communicating with them. That was when I really started tapping in, was when I would like go out into the forest and just sit with a plant. And I would, I was able to just tap in from an early time to be able to listen to what they had to say. 
And it was actually Mario who kind of got me onto the path because he was looking into herbs that you could blend with cannabis because he wanted to kind of like stretch out his, his batch, right? And so he learned about Damiana. And he called me one day, and this was right when we kind of started dating too. He's like, hey, so I learned about this herbs called Damiana. Uh, you can mix it with cannabis. Do you want to go to this herb shop with me? I was like, sure. So we go and we walked in and I swear I was just like, whoa, I've never been in a shop like this. I don't know what's going on here, but I want more. And so I ended up going back to the shop uh, maybe a week later and was asking them about classes and what have you. And uh, they said, well, we also have an internship program. If you want to sign up, you know, you can whatever, sign up. Wow. Intern. And I ended up doing right it. off the so, bat. Right away, I was like, just, just whatever. N- Jump in. Not into the herb world at all. It's like, you want a job? So we're hiring. I don't know. <laughs> Seems like a great fit. <laughs> it was kind of crazy, too, because I'm like, wow, really? They're like, yeah, just come to this meeting and write us a letter as to why you think you'd be good for the, you know, as an intern. And so anyway, I worked there as an intern for, I think it was like six weeks, and then they ended up hiring me. So then I started working there. And I was like working with medicines and pouring tinctures and filling herb jars and everything else and um, worked there for about a year. And then I just started doing it on my own. So I started like a really small herbal company uh, that I had for about a year or two. And then it kind of just progressed into what it is now, which is mostly me like shmo- like sharing what I do. So sharing recipes, showing people how to make things, because that's where I find Uh, my heart sings the most is when I'm like teaching people and sharing and showing people that they can do this on their own and then seeing them light up when they see that like maybe a lot of these herbs actually grow in their yard or really close to them and that they can collect them themselves and make tinctures and oils and what have you. Um, And so that's what I'm currently doing right now is kind of just trying to spread the herbal love, you know, and it's working out. We love that. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to share that love. Got to share it. You have to. You can't have it all for yourself. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What uh, what herb shop was that, if you don't mind me asking? I'm a a Portland human myself. Oh, yeah. It's literally called The Herb Shop. Oh. (laughs) So, yeah, it was called The Herb Shop. Yeah, you never, never heard of it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah what the heck Romy it was on Hawthorne you know you know Hawthorne Boulevard I sure do okay so it was on Hawthorne it's not the herb shop anymore it's now called uh Wildish it was like retaken over and everything but mm-hmm. there is still an herb shop which is on Mississippi Avenue and that's the one that I actually I helped to open that one and then that was the one that I actually like ultimately worked at for a while oh they had one on Hawthorne and Mississippi those are like two popping popping streets very popping. Yeah. Nice. And when it when Mississippi location opened, it was kind of right in the beginning stages when it well, not the beginning stage stages, but it was kind of before a lot of the development happened on Mississippi. So it was mm. right in that like yeah, you know, yep. stage there. No. Um so anyway, it was cool. There's uh Phoenix Aurelius. Uh he's a he's like a spagyrics guy. Um, yeah. He had a he had a shop. Uh and I know there's uh, I talked to him. I thought he was a nice guy. Actually, now that I'm saying it, I'm bringing up some like uh, some other humans have said some things about this guy. But I will say, I think he had a uh, he had a spagyric shop uh, on Mississippi as well, where they were doing like oh. some like pretty uh, in depth, crazy tonic drinks, which is awesome because it's it's rare to find places where because you know. I was just talking to a friend about this earlier. I was like, oh, I'm going to go grab a bottle of, you know, vodka or tequila and, you know, s- start to spike it with like pine um, and some skull cap and essentially making a tincture, but it's not, qu- I'm not calling it a tincture. I'm just going to mix it with that. And then I'm going to enjoy m- beverages uh, of infused alcohol through the solstice to pay my homage uh to the moon and things you know in the passing of the times but what so uh what what's the difference between just like putting some plants in some uh and some modern spirits as opposed to like infusing a tincture a uh, good question i guess a lot of it would have to do with time and intention in my opinion 
So like if your intention is to have libations and use this as a mixer, have it as a base for cocktails, you know, that's the intention that's going to go into it. And then versus like a tincture, I mean, it's the same same method, you know, putting the herbs into the vodka or whatever it is um, and letting it infuse. But with the tincture, like I usually, the base time is usually six weeks for me. That's mm -hmm. usually like mm -hmm. what you usually hear. And you could do that with, you know, what you're doing too. Um, but I think intention is everything, just like with everything in life. There's so much that you can do with intention. And so I like to have an intention in each thing that I make, whether it be a cream or a tincture or an oil or whatever. So I think that would be the main difference in my opinion. And then obviously with the flavored vodkas, you know, you can do orange peel and you can do coffee and you can do all sorts of stuff. Um, so yeah, that would be the difference in my opinion anyway. And then the yeah. dosage, you mm. know, your intended dosage, dosage is, is huge too. You should be taking shots versus drops or dropper fulls or what have you ever, ever since uh i've been taking tinctures for a hot minute now um uh, definitely a, a longer a bit longer than a decade i remember i think i got into my, my first tincture uh herb herb tincture probably probably about 10 10 years ago maybe 11 years ago 2011 uh just after high school because so of course like you know in high school i just knew there was no when i was going to school there was no like you know, like no sweet herbalist, even hippies that I knew of. And like, I thought I knew what we considered to be the hippiest of the hippies in the school, you know, and, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it is amazing. And I love it. And one of my favorite things, one of my favorite herbs is in fact, an herb that we had uh, talked about talking about this evening, including um, a tincture that I got from you um, on some trades that we did and a amazing body rub as well in oil and infused oil and that herb that we're speaking about is is saint john's wort and it's a, it's a magical herb it really is and it even had some uh some political clout i think for a bit because um if i'm not mistaken when it was when it was really coming to the market the like the american medical market um i think there was like some some discrepancies with the pharmaceutical companies because they were like oh well you know we can't give everybody st john you know don't let them know too much about st john's work because you know <clears throat> we have uh we have other things to give them you know like sign up for these these classes that are therapists and things like that i don't know <laughs> but uh what what do you love about st john's work when and what, what 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 can you share with us about this this herb oh that's a big question yeah, yeah. um I love it. And I'm so glad that we did that trade and I'm glad you enjoyed it because it is one of the first plants that I really started to make a relationship with, I'd say. Uh, so early on, because it's a pretty common one. A lot of people know St. John's Ward. The first thing people hear about is it, it's helpful for mild depression, you know, so I think that is one of the reasons why pharmaceutical companies don't want people to know about it because it really can actually take the place of somebody's medication who has mild depression. Now, I'm not saying you could just stop cold turkey if you're on <laughs> some sort of antidepressant or whatever. And there is some sort of, you have to just wean yourself off of these things and start incorporating St. John's Ward slowly. But it really does help because I think one of the main reasons is because it's an herb of the sun. And so you're getting that, that, that joyful radiance warmth beauty all the things that come from the sun it is housed in that plant in my opinion and it even kind of looks like the sun the color of it the yellow blossoms it really it like illuminates the area that it's in and you can almost kind of like see it from a from a, a while away you know while you're walking up to it there's this kind of this golden hue you know um i love the mm -hmm. The red medicine that comes from it when you're making anything with fresh St. John's wort, it should always be red because of the property of the hypericin that's in there. That's the main like constituent in there. Um, and the Latin name is Hypericum perforatum, um, which the perforatum is one of the so one of my favorite parts, if we want to go into my favorite part, it's the yes. the, per, the perforations that you see in the leaves. So I'm not sure. Have you guys ever heard about that? 
Like uh, I've seen lots, lots of St. John's wort because, like you said, once you once you know what it looks like, it's hard to miss. But um, the perforatums is that sounds like like veins or something or uh, lines running in the in the in the leaves of the flower or the plant, like the leaves on the stalk. It's in the leaves. And so if you, one of the identifiers, if you can take, you pluck a leaf from the plant and hold it up to the sun, you'll see these tiny little perforations, like these little tiny holes in the leaf. Oh. And the holes, they harness the essential oil of the plant, but the holes, in my opinion, have like a huge significance. And one of them being, I find that those holes are kind of like gateways. Like if you're wanting to work on some trauma work, or some darker areas of yourself that you know is going to bring up something kind of gnarly. Mm. The St. John's wort is really good for that because it has that signature, that hole of saying like, no, walk through this. It's a gateway. It's like a portal. And the, the awesome thing about the St. John's wort is that it's inviting you to do that, but it's actually going to bring you this joyful uh, resonance while you're working on these darker, deeper sort of subjects within yourself. Um, there's a an herbalist by the name of Matthew Wood who I really enjoy, and one of his things about St. John's Wort is that the holes symbolize a medicine that will help you to find the holes in your own self. Wow. So you, isn't that so profound? There's a, a amazing, and a question I have about that is a lot of times my my thoughts are the essential oil is in the, the flower the petals like in the flowering part so i thought in order to catch that is that is that true is there is it condensed in the petals of the flower and bloom or is it uh in those perforated holes in the leaves like where where is most of the essential oil is it different from well, plant to plant also well it's in both and so there is the, in the flower is where you'll see, you know, like around the, the, the border of the flower, there's like those red dots. Mm -hmm. That's, that's also the essential oil. So that's the hypericum, hypericin. And so that's the, that's where you're getting the red color from. So there's the essential oil in the petals, and then there's the, the more essential oils inside of those holes. So you can kind of essentially use that as a whole plant extract. That's what I like to do. Like when I harvest it, I'll use the tops, but I just kind of chop that whole thing up the stem as well and use that. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's kind of oils throughout the whole thing. Um, and you can also see those red they almost look like black dots. You'll see them in the leaves as well. So it's kind of throughout. I like how the I like how it's yellow and red, like that. You know, like the orange. Orange is a big uh, spiritual color. You know, like in uh, ancient India and and uh, and I think a, a lot of theologies, orange is like one of the highest colors um, up there in like the the spiritual spectrum, like orange baby like we got that glow <laughs> that's beautiful that's beautiful so you were talking uh um i i did kind of interrupt you i'm terribly sorry because you were going on you're a good glow there uh no you're good what were you telling us about uh about about your about your favorite uh or one of your favorite herbalists and and going in on um on the perforated symbolism yeah so like a remedy to help you find the holes within yourself and i look at that as like an auric field, emotional, spiritual, physical, even, you know what I mean? All around. Uh, and then kind of like we were talking about before we came into the room, um, the whole idea of these holes. So he kind of also talks about this being a plant of the little people or the fairies. And so the holes being symbolic that this is a plant of the fairies because they too will hang out in these areas where there's wow. portals. And so they kind of guard the portals. They're known for pulling people into these portals and, and pushing people back out. Um, a lot of times these spaces reside, you know, where water and rocks are, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, there's like forest portals into trees and things like that. And so the whole idea that St. John's wort too would be hung over people's windows and doorways during the summer solstice because it, it would as a plant of protection to like protect the home from the fairies entering. So there's this whole thing going on with that. 
which is another really cool thing that wow. I love about the perforation of it. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's like a gateway to the other to the other side too. I think it's I just look at those holes as a huge gateway, um, and it's awesome in so many ways. Even even chemically too. I mean, when you're speaking about if it if it really helps with depression, then that's like a gateway to get to the other the side of your mind state or your consciousness. Because man, you know, if you really are having issues with depression, um, there's so much of yourself that you're not tapping into. You're just you know, having speaking from experience as we all go through these bouts, you know, a lot like lack of energy, you know, you're not seeing the limelight, you're not optimized. But um, yeah, St. John's work, when I have that medicine, and when I have that plant enter my realm, and enter my body, and, and its chemical constituents coexist with mine, and we intermingle and make sweet love on a cellular <laughs> level, I am, I am beaming. I love St. John's for I do, I do, I do. <laughs> nice. Yeah, dude. Dan, were you going to say something? Uh, yeah, well, to be devil's advocate a little bit, can you, is, can, is it possible <laughs> to take too much of it or is there side effects from taking it? That's a good question. Um, some people say that it can make you more photosensitive if you're taking a lot of it so I heard you, this. yes so you could go into the sun and it might scorch you a little bit more uh, um and then specifically uh, one of the major things is like uh you hear about uh, making farmers making sure that their cattle aren't eating it because the cattle can actually get sunburned and there are, have been reports of cattle actually dying from overexposure from the sun and that they were because they became hypersensitive to the sun but i'll say one of the mm. cool things about it is that if you apply St. John's wort oil to your skin and go out into the sun, it will protect you. It's not going to be like putting on like SPF whatever, which I don't condone anyway. 90,000. Yeah, but, you know, there are specific oils <laughs> and plants that can help to just like naturally protect. And St. John's wort has been known to do that um, as a protectant too, externally, so, which so I think is interesting when it, when it's what glands is it working with mainly when you ingest in St. John's wort tincture like what where are these serotonin secretions coming from Just That's a good over? question Well I know that famously it works really well with the nervous system so anything dealing with the nerves it's really good for So as far as serotonin is concerned I is am it not 100% sure Technically yeah, it it sometimes could categorize as a nerving. Okay. It's not like um I'm trying to think of another nerving that that like uh I think of like uh blue vervain. vervain. Yeah. Nice. It's not as it's not that that's a good thing. It's not as like strong as that. It's more like calming, I find. Or because St. John's wort works really good with the digestive system. There's a lot of nerves up in there. Mm -hmm. Um uh, anything topical, like nerve pain that's topical, it can even work with sciatica and things like that, you know, the SI joints of the lower back. Um, but I would have to like research the serotonin thing. That's a good question. Cause I've never, I've never really like even heard anyone talk about specifically asking that, but that, that makes sense because of the depression thing, you know? Well, I, I'm curious. I'm always curious in glands, glands, you know, I think, I think glandular health is, really important you know it's obviously yeah, like our because you're a gator that's right <laughs> and what do we love what do we eat this the sphincter glands I, sorry i'm sorry everybody that was completely what? uncalled for what are you talking about i don't know i don't know um but yeah anyways <laughs> you got to keep care of your glands and the thought because i know a lot of people have thyroid issues um in general in society and you know, that's probably due to some, uh, you know, societal issues, obviously, or like long-term, uh, long-term trauma. I feel like just living in this, this unhealthy world that, that, that has kind of been created through the, <laughs> through the fucking history. Yeah. Like, you know what we live in? I don't even know what you guys, anyways, yeah. uh, but what's, totally. I, I kind of want to talk about the difference between internal and external because it seems to have one not every plant you can just i mean i'm sure you can put most plants in they're going to be 
relatively healthy and a topical, but they're not going to have all of the medicinal qualities um, that's they carry when you ingest them. So that's what makes St. John's were awesome is you can ingest it and have that interaction with uh, your serotonin. But then again, you can also, it's an incredible topical. So what's up with the skin stuff, bud? Yeah, I well, I think it's because of, like the like because of its actions with the nerves. Yeah, and I mean, our skin is like it, you're sensitive to touch. So anything you know, if you're not numb, you know, for some reason, you put your hand on your other hand, and you're going to touch that. You're going to feel it. It's your nerves' response, right? So the St. John's Wort just like they it has an affinity for the nerves, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's such a powerful topical, and that's why I love to pair it with cannabis so much because oh. it pairs beautifully with cannabis and i think cannabis obviously has different properties than saint john's wort does but cannabis for anyone like yourselves who know especially romy who you like interact with it very much it is it loves the sun it is like give me sun give me heat just give it to me and that's saint john's wort has that same energy and so i think that that's one of the reasons why they really vibe well together and then obviously their pain relieving properties um, and and then the relaxing sensation that comes from St. John's work because it is working, um, you know, as a gentle nervine uh, to soothe the nervous system and what have you. So that in and of itself makes it wonderful. And when you make the oil, like you can do a solar infusion and that's what I like to do with it. Like take the fresh plant and you add like a tiny bit of vodka to it because the thing when you're making oils with fresh plants, a lot of times they'll go moldy because there's so much moisture in the plant. So you just do like, you have your herb, you take like a tape, a teaspoon of hundred proof vodka, throw it in there and then put your oil in. And it's specifically with the St. John's wort, when you use the vodka too, and you do a solar infusion, it really helps to draw out the hypericin. So it makes this just beautiful, like scarlet red oil. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. It's awesome, man. It's so great. And it's great for the blood, too. I mean, that that red color, um, you can't deny that that's like has something to do with the blood, which then can go. We can even go into like, you know, the beheading of St. John. And it, some people correlate the actual red color with the blood of St. John from his beheading. Some people also correlate it with with the blood of Christ. Um and one of the connections with the the whole Christ thing is that when you look at St. John's wort, like top down, the branches make a cross, like all the way down the main stem. So you can like look from the top and that's another indicator or ID that you can know um, that you have St. John's wort is that cross that happens. So there's a whole connection, which is a whole other rabbit hole with it too, you know? Uh, yeah, super fascinating, I mean, especially because you brought up the sun, you know, it, the first thing you brought up that is like emanates the sun. And then then you tell us that it emanates red, which emanates blood. And then you have like these <laughs> that, you know, the, the both of them, right, the life force of the both of them, the necessity of both of them for our, our existence, right, we need our blood and we need the sun. And then you cross correlate it with this Jesus figure. And that's quite interesting, you know, the son of Christ. Um, yeah, super deep rabbit holes to get into there, man. Wow. St. <laughs> John's War. And yeah, of course, the beheading of St. John's, which did we, didn't we do a show about that just like a month ago or so, Dan? If I'm not mistaken. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, a Sunday slow burn about uh, the beheading of St. John. Oh, uh, when I looked it up on the internet, it just said that uh, St. John's War was... Uh, you can find it in June, around June 24th, which is St. John's birthday. And so that's why it's called that. But that seems like a very simple answer. So I, I like the idea <laughs> that it has crosses on the branches. That brings a whole new, like, Christian perspective to it, you know. And the blood idea also very much deepens the idea of it being. But usually like a wart this isn't spelled the same though, yeah? Like a wart on your skin, or is it? No, it is. And wart actually basically just means plant. So it's like St. Oh, John's does. wart plant, you know, or like you have uh, mug, mug wart. They call mug wart, uh, mug wart. 
because it used to be used to bitter uh, as a bittering agent for beer. Like before they were yeah. using hops and all that stuff, you know, they had all a plethora of herbs that they would go to, uh, you know, to make herbal beers and stuff. We should definitely on one of our later episodes get into that um, because I love, I, I love, I've I brought it up on the show multiple times, but I love going oh, back before the German purity law. Like the German purity law is the reason that's it's part of the reason why society is so fucked um, in a lot of ways, <laughs> because like when they took out uh, and made it illegal for us to drink actual herbal alcohol, alcohol and spirits that contain the spirit. So there's a lot of talk about I'm, I'm going to digress just right after this, I promise. But um, a lot of talk about what what the spirit is in alcohol, right? It brings up the spirits in you. Um, but I think in alchemical text, it's actually speaking it's because al alcohol is an alchemical creation and it's used for alchemical medicine. Uh, it's used for spagyrics. It's used for uh, uh, ancient healing in a lot of ways, right? So it's very, very old. And, um, but what it is, it's the spirit of the plant. So it's the spirit of, you've captured the spirit of earth within the bottle. And so like, it's, it's a lot of different spirit talk in there. And um, when the German Purity Act came to be, um, happened also, very conveniently with this right around the the reformation you know and uh the burning of witches and like all this other <laughs> shit and so it's just you know here we are yet again fucked so what i want to do is i want everybody to go out and get that bottle of vodka okay and stuff it full <laughs> of herbs okay and 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 give it intention and do something beautiful with it and and celebrate something you know celebrate the solstice for real you know what i'm saying anyways that's how i'm feeling lately i'm sorry michelle to to catch me on such <laughs> a night where sorry. i'm feeling so i'm feeling so like this but it's wonderful you've got me inspired <laughs> nice i'm here for it all just just give it to me it's all good <laughs> <laughs> no this is awesome <clears throat> excellent yeah, the herbal beers, I could, yeah, we should definitely talk about that because that is one of my favorite areas to explore uh, because I do think, it, I think there's a whole, uh, you know, uh, movement away from what what beer, herbal beer was actually intended for and that was for medicine. You know, it's like, shocker, we're not supposed to be, like, drinking fucking beer bongs of it and stuff. You know, you can. <laughs> I have. It's fun when you're in the mood or whatever. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was actually, oh, you feel under the weather? Oh, well, I made this dandelion root beer. Let's have this so your body can start to, you know, do a natural detox process and help your help your liver do what it's supposed to do, which is, you know, rid yourself uh -huh. of stuff that isn't you know, benefiting you anymore. And so yeah. Yeah. there's this whole thing, you know, going on. And then you have the natural fermentation that's in there. So you have those benefits as well. You know, yep. the whole thing. There's a and whole whole I'll, world of it. Imagine it being yeah, a I natural probiotic. Correlated it to, yeah, I correlated it to like distilling water because water was so horrible because all full of bacteria and people were getting sick from water. So if they distilled it and yep. cleaned it and added herbs to it and stuff they could drink it without getting sick totally yeah. that yeah. makes total sense yes yeah yeah and it's uh it's one of the it's the roots of magic a lot well. of alcoholics now yeah <laughs> it's just so rooted they got dirty water and uh <laughs> yeah oh it's definitely no, genetically like handed down life. yeah it's yeah i mean there's yeah. there's no doubt there's no doubt i mean i I come from a, a, my father was an extreme alcoholic as are many. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, like, I mean, America's got a drinking problem, sure. But uh, so does England, so does Scotland, Ireland, you know, uh, a lot of places. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it's really connected to, uh, but you know, I say that, I uh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know nothing. All right, Roman, Roman, has not been to Japan, unfortunately, and he has not been to the high mountains of Nepal and knows not of the uh, bubbly beverages Sake. that lay upon those those humans. So, um, but what I do know is that 
the germ purity act, uh, act screwed us over and is terrible. <laughs> um, but I, I want to I want to talk about your products, Michelle. You make stuff. Can you tell us what you make and why you make them? And uh, of your yeah, John totally. Products? Yeah. And, you know, the whole alcohol thing, I, I love talking about this subject, by the way, so we can whatever. I, I think that alcoholism is like, uh, well, drinking alcohol is like one of the best ways to avoid self. So if you have, oh, a bunch God, of shit so true. You're avoiding. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. You can eat sugar to avoid self. You can watch TV, obviously. But I think um, specifically alcohol, it's so socially like, OK, it's not really taboo. Uh, it's so normal. It's a part of a lot of people's lives. Um, so anyway, just on that tip, it's like, yeah, that that's a whole rabbit hole. I come from a long line of people who love to drink had to kind of get over that hump myself at a certain point. Uh, herbs helped me do that because I was able to like, I found something that I loved so much that I was like, I have to focus. Like I have to be so much more present than I am if I'm like concerned with drinking and partying and all that stuff. So anyway, but um, yeah, back to, <laughs> back to the <laughs> um, segue. Um, yeah, no, I make quite a few things and I've been making a handful of things that I've been making like for pretty much the whole time I've been into this stuff. But um, I like to focus on on everyday products that people use. So like deodorant and creams, like lotions, um, like salves, anything that you would usually buy at a drugstore. That was like mm -hmm. my first main goal because when uh, my correlation of herbal studies was blending a lot with like truth or information that Mario and I were starting to come across. So one of my uh -oh. first rabbit holes was like learning all the crap that's in lotions that you use and hairspray and gel and all of those things. So it was kind of like my mission. All sperm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you think so? <laughs> it makes Burn sense, dude. <laughs> <laughs> As a former uh, moose and gel alcohol, like a holic, whatever. Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> it probably totally is. It probably comes from Planned Parenthood too, or something like that. Oh uh, no! I'd love to see the factory. Like, oh. what, what do we got going on here? Is it just vacuum pumps and. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i mean yeah i could they're working be. something about mary but <laughs> it's <laughs> i don't want to go down that road really too much but it you know it's good for your skin that's you hear that uh so that when you put it in lotions and facial creams and stuff like that it's a uh, anti-aging wait oh wait are we so what's happening yeah, are we this, talking about sperm we're talking about sperm <laughs> yeah. and we're talking about oh okay so yeah. but we're talking about products is that a thing that companies have been found that they use sperm That's in their products conspiracy theory oh it's I, your I conspiracy so. theory yeah, I think, oh, okay I, I think they do yeah <laughs> that you realize like though fiberglass that's, fiberglass you, in the chapstick there's no way they could get that much brother how are they going to get all that where are they going to get all the sperm uh you know animals animals monkeys it doesn't have to be yeah. human necessarily i know but it Damn, just seems that's inefficient dark. <laughs> huh? it seems inefficient i mean that's a like a, does it well it depends this is if these are mass-produced products well, I'm, I'm assuming well, the quantity we talk you about... might need is a large load if you will where's the drums at where the drums at <laughs> but uh, you know i mean <laughs> but let's yeah let's, when you talk let's about hear, Let's talk when you about talk logistics. about certain plants and their when you talk about certain plants and their attributes and uh, the different things they're good for, and then you talk about what that is also good for. Uh, why wouldn't they put it in skin cream? I'm not. I'm not. I'm not discerning whether or not it is good or, or good not. I'm just actually product. wondering if there's a way yeah. to get that much to to get, make mass produced product. I because I we know it's good for the skin. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, all all the body blood is great for things. You know, my, tears are great yeah, for my casting stomach is spells. Super soft. Uh, <laughs> anyways, please let Michelle talk about her products. Okay. <laughs> oh man, uh, so I said I didn't want to get into it. Maybe it time. is high in zinc. So just so you know, oh. so oh. it's high in zinc. So you know, um, and sense yeah. of smell is connected to zinc. So if you if your sense of smell is not so good, you might be low on zinc. 
man or man aim or for your, aim for your nostrils boys oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. what you're saying <laughs> yes. so, a lot of those people that lost their sense of smell and taste maybe it zinc could... it up a little bit yeah definitely definitely wait didn't it's, they say it's... zinc was the thing know. for uh for covid I, I heard i heard zinc stuff i don't know i'm you know, saying like amanda now. vollmer like she talked a lot about zinc magnesium vitamin c that's like kind of the the trio that's kind of one of those ones that i would say is a good place to start you know for In supplements general. if you're into that yeah if you're into it um but yeah with products i don't put sperm in them <laughs> Nice. <laughs> I haven't tried that. Fantastic. Um, uh, but You're yeah, already no. on the right track. I, I thought so, man. I... <laughs> oh man. Well, one of the things I love, I love making. I do love making. RFTA tools. certified. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, I love making oils, like uh, infused oils. So um, like right now, I'm just going to say, you know, I've got uh, like body butter right now that I'm really stoked on, which is a CBD uh, body butter. That's a new product. I've got some tinctures. I love making tinctures. Anointing oils is something that I really like too, because anointing oils can be used in all sorts of ways. You can use it for your body, but you can also anoint things that you're working with. So if you like to do divination of any kind or what have you you have tools mm -hmm. that you like to use you mm -hmm. can use oils on that um you can do the same thing with tinctures too and making some sort of like wash and stuff like that um but, but i think that my true love is just trying to get make products for people that they can replace their everyday things that are harmful so tooth powder is another thing i really like to make that i've been making for a long time Mm -hmm. because toothpaste is a weird one there's like a lot of weird things even in natural toothpaste that are not beneficial to our mouths whatsoever mm -hmm. yeah like like vegetable glycerin like if you <laughs> see like natural toothpaste a lot of them a lot of like the they first all or have second sugar ingredient. alcohols in them yeah and i'm like dude what the fuck like the glycerin thing it literally just coats your teeth and it doesn't so yep. it doesn't even allow you know anything beneficial to even get to them it's really Doc strange dr harry's is what i use in the jar uh I oh love that's it. a good one i love dr yeah. harry's mm -hmm. they have really good products actually they have like a whole line mm -hmm. of, i use their seaweed hair gel so. mm -hmm. because i'm such a conspiracy theorist right the top five weirdest beauty cream ingredients from How Stuff Works. And oh God. number five is placenta. I was going to say. Number four mm -hmm. is whale vomit. Number three is bird droppings. Number two, cow dung. And number one is semen. What? <laughs> number one. Come on. It says, yes, semen. Several companies are making moisturizing creams with this very unusual ingredient. Semen contains a very powerful antioxidant called spermine. A Scandinavian company called Skin Science makes an entire line of spermine beauty creams and tout the antioxidant as That's being 30 times stronger than vitamin E. <laughs> this means that semen can be used to do everything from moisturizing your skin to healing your sunburn. Not only that, but all bull semen treatment is being used in some hair salons to give your locks some extra shine. Another company <laughs> called C Men, with a, just the letter C, Beauty now delivers actual semen to your home in discreet packaging. <laughs> they maintain that the donors of the product are tested monthly to ensure a safe and quality moisturizer. So I am not crazy. Whoa. What? Oh my god, dude, you're fucking hilarious. Okay, first <laughs> of all, wild. can we talk about whale vomit for a second? Can we just can we just <laughs> whale vomit? Can we just talk yeah. about SeaWorld? Listen, That's okay. Unusual. Free Willy, free Willy of his vomit, so thus we can have our topical creams. Free me wi free Willy, you're vile. Willy, vile into this bucket, will you? I must rub it on myself. <laughs> And then I'm going to go to this bowl and put it into the same bucket mm -hmm. and have them. And I'm going to, that's crazy. That's insane. So the whale vomit, it says the first time people hear that whale vomit is an ingredient in some beauty creams, they may feel like someone is pulling their leg. Yeah. But it's very much true. And it's perhaps better known by its <gasps> other name, Ambergis. Amber Gris. Yeah. Amber uh. G R I S. Ambergris. 
and because this flammable waxy substance has been used for centuries and is very valuable. It's added as a fixative in perfumes, some of which find their way into your beauty cream. A fixative is used mainly to reduce the rate of eva evaporation of the perfume. Ambergris is hard to find and tough to identify, which makes, makes it worth so much money. The price of ambergris varies like any sought after commodity but it generally hovers around $10 per gram. Considering that you could find a chunk as large as 100 or more pounds, ambergris hunting can be pretty profitable pastime. So if this podcast doesn't work out, Roman, we're going to go hunting for <laughs> some whale vomit then. So this must be coming from Japan. Remember all that whale uh, that <sighs> whale hunting they were doing? I wonder if they were using it um, for meat because it's like how, how – Sperm whales. How on yeah. earth? Oh, sperm whales. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, we just broke the internet, dude. <laughs> gotcha. No, but what is what is rather interesting is uh, the Scandinavian companies, uh, like, you know, because we know, like, Bill Gates and those, like, off, like, there's so much money and science experiments happening mm -hmm in the north of Norway and Iceland and Greenland and those tiny little islands where other seed banks are held <laughs> in the lofts of mountains stuck in the sides and hollowed is out. Your, is that your Elon Musk impression? Hey. Or <laughs> fucking robot? Listen, guys, here's the deal. St. John's Wort's awesome. Are, do we have any more folklore on St. John's Wort? <laughs> oh, well. Nice um, segue. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, well, we brought up, I brought up mugwort earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the folklore tales of it is that St. John wore mugwort on his chest when he went out on his travels because of the protection element of mugwort. And so I think that they are, mugwort and St. John's wort are awesome in that way because they offer protection, but in different ways. So St. John's wort, I feel like it can protect things from like, coming in just like i was saying they'll hang it over their windows or their doors to protect from what they'll say witches or fairies or what have you whereas um and the saint john's work kind of has more of that gateway like it's like allowing it's like asking you to come in and then the the mugwort will protect you while you're in those realms if that makes any sense so mugwort like will take you into like the dream realm or if you're wanting to meditate and kind of try and do some sort of channeling or whatever mugwort will take you there but it will also protect you while you're in the space and i feel like saint john's wart more is like the guard at the gate of the portal you know what i'm saying um and so I think that there's an interesting correlation there with the connection to St. John the Baptist and Mugwort and then them being both protective, but in different ways, but like working together in some, in some way as well. But other. Symbiosis. Um, mm-hmm. Totally. Other folklore with yeah. it. Yeah. Did, what's Off the good? top of my head. What's a good uh, what's a good source to like find um, if you have like any writers or authors or anything that uh, any books that are good for like think stories like that like Saint John himself wore a ring of mugwort around his neck as he went out because when you know looking these things up they are really interesting I love folklore and plants but I feel like herbs and plants and and, and history. Uh, and folklore, like they're all like scattered. So you have to pull all these different sources. But do you have like an author or a book or like a channel or anything that has um, fun folklore and herb stories? Yeah. So this book, I have this right here, just not planned, but oh, wow. I brought him that up is, already. Matthew that is, Wood. Is this planned? Ooh, that's a thick <laughs> no, book. It's too. not planned. I just, I had it. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is a tome. This is awesome. Matthew Wood is really great. Um, this is the book of herbal wisdom. Uh, this is oh. the book that I, where I got the, um, where he talks about the little people, like it being an herb of the little people, okay. the nice. fairies. Yes. He's awesome, dude. I mean, he, um, he's not like a conspiracy theorist by uh, really, but he goes there. Like he'll have people come to him who have been, um, victims of like satanic ritual abuse or oh, wow. they mm. have been abducted by aliens, they say, or he just has mm. these people that just kind of 
he's attracted to it. He's open to it. I think that's why. So he writes what? stories about his clinical practice in this book and goes into some stuff that's really interesting. So Matthew was a good there, place to start. Is there a nice. plant that attracts aliens or repels them? Mm -hmm. Good question. Oh. I don't know. Do, do, do. I have to think about that. I have an X file soundbite right now. <laughs> another like Matthew another Wood good is, book. Uh, a teacher as well. He has like a whole school online. Yes, he's great. He's been at it for a long time. He's kind of one of the OGs in in like more of the mainstream herbal community, I guess. Um, a modern herbal, which is a two volume set, is awesome, and so you can usually find it pretty cheap online, um, and it's. If I had just two books that I could have forever, those would be the two because she goes into the folklore, but she goes into the medicinal uses. There's recipes in there. And it's from, I think, like the 30s or something like that. Um, and I was gifted that um, early in my journey. And it's always one that I go for. Another one is called um, The Master, is the, the book of, I have to think about it. Anyway, I won't say it because I can't, I can't think of the title right off the top of my head. I might look it up. Um, then, um, yeah, those are the two that are coming to me. If I come, if I think of something else while we're streaming along, I'll let you know. For sure. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah, I just love, we just love folklore stories around here. Uh, anything with little <laughs> mythical creatures and beasts. I would like to do an online role-playing uh, podcast if anybody's interested. Uh Sounds like a lot of fun and a lot of hours. <laughs> is, there, playing is, there any, the uh, pl is there any plant that's called like dragon toe or something like that? <laughs> oh, dragon tooth. Yes. Mm, dragon Raven's tooth. Claw. If, you don't have to say yes or no, but if there is, that's, that, that's fun. That's fun. We like that. Nephilim. There are dragon. Skull. <laughs> Gold. A uh, uh, skull cap. Yes. Oh. Oh, uh, skull cap. Ooh. Skull cap is a good one. Monk's hood is mushroom? another uh no, it's a it's a plant. It's a that's a nervine. So mm. that one is really great. So skull cap, like you can use it to kind of just think of like um having like some something come onto your head to just like kind of calm you down, bring you down like this. Like it kind of creates this almost like cap feeling on your head when you're taking it. It's interesting. Mm. Um that's a good one um yeah there's all sorts of stuff you guys feel familiar with the doctrine of signatures no okay this is a good this is a good place to go so the doctrine of signatures is basically the concept that the plant the shape of the plant the color of the plant where it grows mm. all of these things will indicate and tell you what it will be good for what what system ah. of the body it will work good with um, what kind of conditions it works good with. So if something grows in like maybe like kind of a wet swampy area, it would be good for a condition with a lot of maybe wet, damp congestion. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. And Matthew Wood goes into that in depth in this book. Um, and so even if you're just like a beginner with herbal uh, studies, I really highly recommend that book because it's it's something else. He just has a special way of explaining things, too. Oh, very interesting. I'm going to yeah. shoot, shoot him an email. See what's Sorry. see what's up. See if he wants to chat. He's a good one. <laughs> I'm like, hey, give me all your elf stories. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> uh so uh what's your favorite oh. combination with uh with St. John's wort when it comes to uh stack and tinctures? Uh with stack and tinctures. Um I would say with St. John's wort, I uh, cannabis again. I think it's a good combination. Noise. Yeah, I would do CBD. I mean unless you're working with somebody. Makes who, sense, right? Jesus yeah. and Mary. Yeah, there you Oh, that's a good one. Hell yeah, man. They it blends freaking awesomely. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and if you wanted yeah. to do like a sun tincture, another good one is calendula. That's a um, pretty common one that a lot of people know about. But St. John's Wort and calendula mm. works really well together and has some That's of the a same Roman properties. emperor, right? Calendula? That's I don't a, that's know. A joke. 
Oh, <laughs> it's Caligula. <laughs> I think Caligula is literally named after a calendar, right? Isn't it named after calendar? Oh, uh, okay. It, yeah, it Makes has sense. this. Yep, totally. It's like the same root. Oh, okay. Yes. I, I think that there's some like that. They grow from the same tree, same stock. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. I'm just making super plant jokes over here. Don't listen to anything I'm saying. They're from the. <laughs> Oh goodness. Well, uh well, let's see. Is uh do you, you have any final uh goodness you would like to share with the fire tribe on this beautiful glorious day? Um as we wane the conversation and maybe uh some sweet plugs for yourself, any events you got coming up, uh fun products on the line and where and where and how people may get a hold of you. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Uh, well, I just will say I'm stoked to have been here and to be hanging out with you guys and starting this herbal journey with you because I just really think that herbal, we are all plants almost like, yes. like, I feel like there's something like that. We, there's a reason why we're attracted to plants. There's a reason why mother nature is who she is and that we resonate with this energy. And I think that they work on such a deep level. It's, I always try and remind people to not try and not use plants as you would drugs because they're not the same thing and they don't work the same. So there's a lot of people too, who maybe are just brand new to herb herbalism and they've been kind of on more of an allopathic path and they start to take something like nothing's happening, man, nothing's happening. You know, I hear that a lot. I've heard that a lot over the years. It's like, yeah, it takes time. And especially if your body hasn't been introduced to it and you're kind of slowly doing introducing you just have to be patient and i think like that's one of the biggest lessons that the plants have taught me is patience is everything and um the the healing is there for us it's just sometimes you have to seek and and, and seek it out and find it and go sit with plants um and they will they will bring you so much healing even though you may have not even known you had something to heal. That's how deep they go. And I'm kind of like now, ever since um, kind of starting to explore, you know, uh, terrain theory versus germ theory, and then you have German new medicine and all this stuff. I'm kind of like starting to wonder if herbs basically work in the way that when you take an herb they are just like stimulating the organ system to help your body um fight off if you want to say the ail whatever's ailing you do you know what i mean like maybe it's not that the plant comes in and like kills off the virus or kills off whatever you're trying to get rid of um it's more of just like it's stimulating that organ system that's going to help your body to naturally start to heal as it's meant to do yeah, I think that's interesting too. Ale, an ailment, you know, we're talking mm. about beer earlier. Mm. Totally. Ale. Yep. Um, yep. I had a weird, funny question to, to kind of end it. Um, you know, sometimes when you see people, they look like certain animals. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep, being yep, that yep, you yep, work yep, a lot with plants, do you start to see people looking like different plants? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes 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 and you can actually like look at a person because we all have body types right so like uh yes. i don't know you might you might run into somebody who's like disheveled and looking like shriveled up and they're <laughs> yeah. they're just not they're not well and they're just like eh, you know there's plants uh -huh. that look like that you know i first, first one yeah and then uh it, does, it really does yeah and he's like what and then <laughs> you put him in and you, something weird happens put it under the bed you know know what's gonna happen but um yeah so like wild lettuce have you guys heard of wild lettuce before mm, nah. okay i mean maybe you've probably seen it it it, it looks okay. like so the grocery uh, store uh, no, no, it grows like it'll oh. grow like along the roadside. It likes oh, okay. it likes kind of like crappy soil. So it'll be like maybe in like a parking lot or something like that. But wild mm -hmm. lettuce, uh, it's kind of sometimes known as opium lettuce because it has the same mm -hmm. latex that comes from like an opium poppy. Um, not as strong as the opium poppy, but it has the same sap. Um, and it can be used for pain and everything else, but sometimes it can be used for people who are feeling like this, like you have like a street person who needs help. I shriveled up. Yep. I'll shrivel up. <laughs> and then it's like wild lettuce is there and it looks kind of like 
all wild and crazy or whatever. Oh, that's it's also different. interesting because it likes disturbed and damaged, uh, uh, or, you know, which is a thing totally when you're look, going into like wild harvesting or, uh, even urban foraging, you know, there, you start to notice that like certain, uh, certain plants, like if you take an aloe vera plant, you know, put it in some just wet ass soil, it's going to like die on you, you know, like it wants like yeah. no soil. And, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I know that the, it kind of blew my mind when, uh, I learned out about maca root and like that it only grows at like such a high elevation that no other plant grows at this like supremely high mountainous range. But when you take it, um, as a human and you ingest it, it apparently allows more blood flow to go through your oxygen. So when you're really high up there, normally you would have a hard time like breathing, but if you're able to take the plant that's in that area that is provided for you and it, it grows up there. Nothing else grows up there. It has those qualities. So it sounds like the same as like with the wild lettuce. Like if you're living on the streets, like, Hey, straight up. And like, you're hurting because you know, you haven't got dope for a bit. Well, guess what has the same kind of latex as your drugs, bro. <laughs> wild lettuce is yeah, dude. gutter, son. <laughs> get in that gutter and get that lettuce. I gotta get yeah, well. Dude. No, totally. <laughs> Living in Portland, man. Oh man, I have seen, dude. I have seen so many homies just I've straight seen some like wild lettuce heads. Forty feet. Yeah, man. I've seen some wild lettuce heads. Out here. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Where? So, are you in Portland right now? No, but I was yesterday. Oh shit. Okay, right on. <laughs> I went and visit some family uh, for a few days. It's fun stuff. Right on. Yeah. Where in Portland? Whole, no way. No fucking way, bro. You want to know where it's fucking St. John's, brah? Oh, the St. John's Bridge no. on Willamette Boulevard, brah. Okay, that's awesome, man. You, you're you in a weave. You're in a weave right now with St. John's. He's talking like he's from fucking New York and he's talking about Portland. No, I'm not. I, 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 listen, listen. Nah, nah. <laughs> like, All right, nah. Get your accents together, dog. All right, uh, Portland, Portland, Portland accent, Portland accent. How do I do this? Uh, yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I think of. <laughs> you suck. I'm the fucking yeah. shit. Okay. Get out of my fucking way. I fucking hate this place. <laughs> <laughs> but I love like, it too. Yeah, I am not I a hipster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were in Portland for like 13 years. Um, hip, hip oh, that's sorry. esoteric as fuck. <laughs> they lived in Portland but, for 13 years. You'd read that in the headline and be like, this is Twilight. Like, well, what code is this? What do you mean? <laughs> this is 13 in Portland. 13 is letter M. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, God. And they're Mario and Michelle. Holy shit. Oh, and my she God. was born on Friday the 13th. Oh, my God. What the fuck is going on? Wait, for real? Oh, you are born on Friday the 13th? <laughs> I was, yeah. Sweet Lord. And you oh. know what? This Embrace year, your divine feminine. <laughs> that's what I say, you know. Absolutely, this, what an honor this it is. Year, my uh, birthday falls on a Friday the thirteenth, which hasn't happened in a long time. So I'm almost looking at it like, all right, it's a, it's like kind of like a golden birthday for me this year. Holy shit! Yeah, yeah it's pretty cool. Maybe pretty cool. you're gonna be. You'll probably complete. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's yeah. It's gonna be some serious shedding there. That's gonna be awesome. I think so. I think so. Yeah. I'm already planning on going to like the hot spring and stuff. I was going to say, do you have an herbal malt, herbal malt? remedy ready for malting? yourself? Malt. I don't yet. Malting. Cannabis yeah. will probably be. Yes. Be cannabis. What is, what month is your birthday? <laughs> January. Oh, <laughs> well, everybody, you heard it. Uh, you, you are listening to this. You shall. To Michelle, a birthday present. All right. <laughs> yeah. Do it. <laughs> Sweet man. Friday. That's kind of crazy being born or being having your birthday on the same day that, like, uh, on like the actual same day that you're born, you know? And wait, that is a birthday yeah. though. Now that they just said that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> week, I know though. what you're saying. I know yes. what you meant. Yeah. But I, real, I just realized it like a couple of weeks ago when I was looking at the calendar. I was like, oh shit. Okay. You know, it's, right you know it's really weird though. Saturday the fourteenth. What the fuck? Whoa. Yeah, what's going on? <laughs> There's semen in it. I swear. <laughs> that must be it. That's the weirdness. I mean, right there. <laughs> oh goodness. Well, happy, okay. Happy early. Happy early divine birthday. Yeah. Oh, shucks. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, I just it kind of just came out as we were talking about the 13 weave. And I didn't even think about the uh, M being the 13th letter. And then it was like, oh, cool. Yeah, okay. yeah, I love all uh, these 13s. That's a trip. Yeah. Uh, kind of yeah oh and the m too huh and yep. i Thank don't Michelle. don't yeah. quote me on this but in the m, trifecta m and p <laughs> are connected somehow the letters m and p um which m no p m no p l m n o p i have i have something else going on in my head uh Anyways, uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, the best herb yes. talk that we've had so far. Sorry, uh, any other herbalists that have been on the show and are listening <laughs> now. If you're upset, we'll maybe do a better job and be cooler like Michelle. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, shit. <laughs> Shots <said> fired. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just had a thought. What, what would be the fun fuck? To talk, <laughs> to talk with you guys about? Is uh, if you you guys have heard about flying ointments? Mm-mm. Why with the witches? You got to catch them. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, you could try, but I don't know if you could. Messenger so whole, messenger potions. <laughs> the whole uh, the whole thought or like folklore that witches use flying ointments on their broomsticks, and oh, it was the flying shit. ointment that got them to the Sabbath to like other realms because the flying ointments yeah. they use poison plants in them poison being uh usually psychoactive plants but you when you use them at low dose they're very potent um and can be very profound and so anyway i just throwing it out there it could be a fun thing if you guys want to get Jesus. into witchy folklore with plants since there's a whole yes. There's a whole side of things that I'm super interested in. And there's a woman, I'll just say this book before we go. Um, her, her name is Corinne Boyer, and her specialty is this whole realm. Um, and mm. she has a book called Under the Witching Tree. And then she also has a book that is called Plants of the Devil. And that oh, is the book where nice. she, she goes in. Yeah, she goes into all of these plants, uh, the, the poison so plants. So every plant. <laughs> <laughs> well kind of i guess you could say that actually yeah you know you really could uh yeah. the plants of the devil that's a really great book if you're interested in more of the folklore magical like darker sides of things with mm -hmm. it um we did do a, a a sunday slow burn on witches and talked about why they use brooms and uh they were they were putting some type of uh psychedelic on there and writing it and that's where like riding the broom comes from uh totally. the saying like riding the broom is like you're on one <laughs> yes <laughs> there we go uh you showed up just in time <laughs> see you later <laughs> not today <laughs> satan <laughs> Adios. Peace be okay. with you. Okay, you know, so get out of here, guys. Get, get out of this. Not here. Not today. Not today, Hakate. <laughs> not today, <laughs> not today Hakate. <laughs> the Domo Origato. Get out of here, Mr. Satan. Um, that sounds great. I mean, I, oh man, the flying ointments. We that's. No, it doesn't sound great. Is your microphone now? Yeah, I'm something just kind of happened <laughs> there. <laughs> Where'd your voice go? Cat got your tongue. Oh, uh, oh. that's a, that's uh, weird. What about? Is it? Uh, what, what, is, what, is, what, is, what? What is? It's, it's kind of like scratchy. Like you can tell it's a connection. It might be a connection thing. <laughs> Well, thank you, Fire Tribe, for listening, and uh, thank you, Michelle, for being here on the show. We appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you again on uh, RFTA News. So, please come back. We'd I will. Have you. And uh, thank you for Fire Tribe, me. Um, go seek her out, give her some love too, and uh, yeah, enjoy. Yeah, you can find me. Oh, go ahead. The interview.
Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, say it again. Say it oh, again. Plug, yeah, plug, say it plug, again. plug, 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 please plug. You can find me at michelleshealinghome.com if you want to yeah. reach out to me. And uh, I also have a podcast that is pretty brand new. I'm on episode, tomorrow's episode five. And if you want to get more into herbs, I'm going to be having Kyle of Tippy Canoe Herbs on tomorrow oh, at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we're going to talk about, we will be talking about St. John's Wort uh, as well, because we're going to talk about the winter solstice, herbs of the sun. And we're also going to talk about the Christmas tree from a medicinal standpoint oh. and the evergreens so that'll be tomorrow at four that's genius yep and that'll be on that's on youtube and i go live at four pacific standard so oh snap okay cool Excellent. uh yep. oh your voice is back oh here we go <laughs> thank you yeah it sounds clear it does, it does. Uh, we are we very, very clear, clear. <laughs> clear. Of course, clear. Yeah, <laughs> okay Thank you. Uh, right. Thank you, Michelle. Until next time. Yeah, thank you, fellas. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to check out our Patreon. All of the links are in the description. Hello, Fire Tribe. Welcome to Rising from the Ashes. I'm Danny Naki Dan. Hello, I'm the Homie Romy. Uh... And sitting in a hotel lobby, uh, drinking some some free coffee, and excited to uh, go very deep with today's guest, uh, a prolific author and a and a, and a wonderful writer, and uh, he's going to, I'm sure, crack the prevailed and proverbial egg upon us, and uh, we're gonna dive deep into some some great gnosis. So I'm really looking forward to this today, sir. Yes, I as well. Yeah, how's it going, Ralph? How you doing? Yeah, very well, thanks. Uh, it's evening over here. I'm over in Europe, so a slightly different time zone to you. But yeah, going very well. Uh, just back from a tour of uh, Anatolia and Egypt. I've been a oh. month in Anatolia. So touring around all of the ancient and megalithic sites. So that was good to get back out there again. Um, I was leading a I was a speaker on a tour, on two tours, in fact. So that was good fun. Wow! Can you give us a little bit of a, a little bit of history about yourself and how you got into studying uh, the religious studies and and how that has prevailed throughout your life? Uh, considering you've been studying this for at least twenty years and you have at least thirty titles of books <laughs> uh yeah um 13 titles so and i've been studying for 40 years really um 13 i started this th 13 titles yeah oh 13 books on amazon on your profile so, uh, page it says you have at least 30 titles oh, maybe the yeah on amazon oh I didn't yeah. even wrote that one anyway. Thirteen's <laughs> enough, I think. You know. Okay. Um, you got some secret ghost writers. Uh, <laughs> some yeah, secret ghost writers hiding under the bed. <clears throat> maybe they're counting up all the different editions or something. Don't know. Don't know how that works. <laughs> um, yeah, I started this um, notionally, I suppose, when I was fourteen, um, by just commenting on the New Testament, and I wrote the first chapter then when I was fourteen. It wasn't published, of course. Um, and that's kept, you know, an interest all of this time. And I got to the 1990s, uh, 95. And th at that point, I decided I had enough information and enough contrarian information, you know, that would make it interesting to people. This was different information that wasn't there in the public sphere. And so I wrote my first book at that point, which was Jesus Last of the Pharaohs. So that was back in sort of 90, 
97, I suppose, um, and been writing ever since. So, yeah, been hard at it ever since because it's an interest of mine. Um, I'm a bit of a truth seeker, I suppose, when I see things that don't add up, um, I try and explain them. And then if I get enough things to explain, I can put it into a book. And there's been a lot of things to explain over the years because a lot of this history is missing. Um, that was my fascination to start with, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as a sort of agnostic, um, become sort of uh, atheist. It didn't make sense that we have all of these stories of these important people, and yet none of them can be found in the historical record. That is a problem for the, you know, the classical interpretation of, of the biblical text. And so I started looking for these characters. And what I found is, 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 is perplexing. It's a bit strange because what I found is that the biblical story is probably something like 90% correct. But just not in the fashion that people have always um, uh, thought and explained. So it's the same story, but slightly different because these these characters were much more powerful than the books tend to make out. And mm. we'll go through this, uh, I think, in these talks. But um, yeah, uh, histories and stories are made about powerful and important people normally. And these were powerful and important people if you know where to look for the data. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the interesting part of, of my research. I'm, I'm wondering how many of these uh, famous characters from antiquity do you believe actually existed or were more um, allegorical, if any? Um, virtually all of them existed. That's, that's the interesting thing. Um, so uh, I think the reason why they say they don't exist is because they were slightly embarrassed by this history. They've, um, they've crafted a story of oppression by, you know, we, we were just the, you know, the poor shepherds and we were being persecuted by all these terrible people. Um, when the actual story was actually of, very powerful and important kings, monarchs, pharaohs of Egypt. And um, I mean, this is it's, it's controversial when you sort of listen to it, but it's not controversial if you know the texts, um, because people like um, Josephus Flavius, first century Jewish historian, supposed to be the, you know, Judaism's greatest historian. Now, Josephus Flavius said that the Israelites were the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. Hmm. Speaking about the Hyksos pharaohs, uh, the shepherd kings, as they're known, he says they are our forefathers. Now, that's controversial, but this is from Judaism's greatest historian, but it's still so con uh, um, controversial that when I tried to put that um, quotation into wiki, it was deleted. And it was deleted probably about 12 or 15 times because we had this running battle with the um, gatekeepers. I don't know if you know Wiki, but it's run by gatekeepers. And most of the gatekeepers have an agenda. Um, so uh, we, we had this running battle for like three or four months between me and another guy who were trying to get this information into Wiki. And it wasn't, you know, super controversial. All we were trying to do is put in this two-line quote from Josephus Flavius to say that the Hyksos were the Israelites. And it was deleted for this reason, that reason. And eventually we were just kicked off Wiki. So we were banned. <laughs> For what did they call it? Sight tempering or something? Sight uh, I, I'm super. I'm super curious about that because um, you know. I mean, I, I, it's unfathomable the the number of people that that gather their resources from Wiki, and um, you know, you hear a lot of talk that you know people can anybody can upload anything. Well, in my in my eyes, what I vision is 
you know, they allow this like freedom of information to come into Wiki and then they'll have somebody like these gatekeepers or whoever is being in control of the board. And uh, it's almost like, it's almost like the idea of like, uh, you know, give, allowing everyone to confess their sins or tell all of the information. Because when you allow all of these individual families and people to have oral stories and histories that maybe aren't in the books, it's almost like, yes, give us all this information. And then we can, we can thus funnel it at, at this point and, and do with it what we will. And, and then see who knows what and see what other information then we can gather and add to our own books and collections. It's, quite an interesting uh, uh internet it's, internet conundrum it's, it's odd to me that uh, you know somewhere like wiki can gather people who are all on a particular agenda and so there's no range of views on wiki so if you want to post about climate because i'm a climate scientist as well uh with um you might say unconventional views on climate, because I don't believe that CO2 is the primary driver of climate. Um, but, you know, I've, I've got a peer-reviewed paper, which is very influential. It's very um, successful. Um, you try getting that onto Wiki, of course, and you cannot. It's, it's banned straight away. If you want to say that uh, wind power is intermittent, you can't. It's banned straight away. Oh, you should have seen the struggles I had went on for six months trying to get that onto Wiki. And then you come down to, you know, the biblical story. And again, it's a very orthodox type gate gatekeepers with no view outside uh, the orthodox explanation for the biblical stories. And they're the one that control whatever is written. You can write whatever you want onto Wiki, um, but there is a gatekeeper there who will um, just revert whatever you've written back to the previous version. And you can't really go against them because they have the power to ban you in the end, which is what they do. So Wiki is, is only very much one view of every topic. It's not a broad range of views. And what they were trying to do is ban anyone saying that there was a story to the Israelites which was outside the norm. Um, and yet quite clearly, there is a story of the Israelites which is is different from the standard interpretation. Um, and and the best example of that is the um, uh, the Exodus event, because mm -hmm. you know we're all familiar with the Exodus. I presume you've been brought up in a sort of vaguely religious type education, so you know all about it. But did you know that there was, a Hyksos exodus out of Egypt as well. Some people call them the Hyksos. Uh, yeah. I call them the Hyksos because Josephus Flavius gives uh, both meanings. These were the shepherd pharaohs of Egypt. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They were the Hicks from the mountains. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, because they, they are sometimes called the uh, kings of the mountains. That's one of the titles they get. The Hicks. Um, so, yes, you, you could call them Hicks from the mountains. <laughs> but these were a people who came in from Mesopotamia and uh, they took over Egypt. So starting in northern Egypt, they took over pretty much the whole of Egypt. Circa something like 2100 BC, something of that nature. Mm. Uh, and then they were kicked out of Egypt in 1600, uh, well, call it 1580 BC. Yeah. And they were kicked out on a grand exodus. And the thing is with this exodus is it's exactly the same as the biblical exodus. So um, the Hyksos, these are Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. They're known as shepherds. So they were both named known as shepherds, the, the shepherd kings. Uh, one of their leaders was called Jacob. Funny that, isn't it? He was called Jacob, Jacob Arm. Um, both were circumcised. Both wore uh, curly side locks of hair. Both wore earrings. Um, and at this time, just before the Exodus, there was darkness for three days. Um, there was a pillar of fire and smoke. There was a great ash fall. And I'm not sure if you're aware of that being one of the plagues, but one of the plagues was an ash fall. Um, Moses said, um, 
Take handfuls of ash from the hearth of the fire and cast it into the sky, and it will become a small dust over the whole of Egypt. That was one mm. of the plagues, and that happened just before the Hyksos exodus as well. Um, and there was uh, the waters were parted by a tsunami. Um, so the, uh, the parting of the waters, the standard thing that everybody knows about. The air was too thick to breathe. That's a comment from Josephus Flavius. Uh, there was a war between these people, the Hyksos and the uh, Egyptians. Um, and there was a great exodus of, well, we don't know, but they say about 500,000 people or something. Um, and they started from Pyramasi and they went to um, Jerusalem. And on the way, they destroyed Jericho. Now, that's the history of the Hyksos exodus out of Egypt. Nothing to do with the biblical texts. Honest. <laughs> Do you, how, in your opinion, uh, through your research, did you uh, did the Hyksos destroy Jericho? Well, this has always been the problem, the thorn in the side of the Exodus story, because they will say there is no evidence for the Exodus. You know, we've done the archaeology in the region, no evidence whatsoever um, for a 13th century um, BC Exodus. And they will add, Jericho didn't even exist at this time because Jericho was destroyed in about 1580 BC by the Hyksos. <laughs> so, okay, if you're looking at the standard Ramesside period for the Exodus, of course you're not going to find any evidence, and you're not going to find any evidence from Jericho. Uh, but if you just cast that story back by about 400 years, well, less than that, 350 or so, um, into the Hyksos period, 1580, BC, then you've got all the evidence you want, because all of those events happened at that time, including the destruction of Jericho, which was at the hands of the Hyksos. Um, and of course, we have all of the plagues. All of those plagues happened in 1600 BC. They were the plagues caused by the um, eruption of Santorini the island out in the Mediterranean. It was the biggest explosion, volcanic explosion in recorded history. Um, and it devastated the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean. And it did cause an ash fall upon Egypt. We know that because you can see the uh, ash in the archaeological um, uh, strata. Um, so there was a great ash fall, and it happened just before the Hyksos Exodus. And of course, the, the volcano itself was a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. And it did cause a tsunami because it was a maritime uh, earthquake and volcano. Uh, and of course, it would part the waters, as we've seen you know, with the Indonesian um, tsunami. The first thing that happens with the tsunami, especially um, a, a, a subduction tsunami, which is a, a subduction uh, volcano, an earthquake, which this was, um, the first thing that happens is the sea just rushes out. It disappears. And so if you're marching with your army close to the shoreline and you see the the sea just disappears, well, you know, what are the soldiers going to do? They're all going to sort of walk out across the seabed, catching the fish that are sort of flopping around, you know, for their morning breakfast or whatever, completely amazed what's happened to the sea. And then, of course, 20 minutes later, the sea comes back in again. And there goes the Egyptian army. Wow. The waters, the waters parted. Yeah, it's a tsunami. And, and then the waters rushed back in again and consumed the Egyptian army. And, that, does, and we, that does add up, too, because just the science of water and the science of tides and the science of waves, when there's a huge wave coming in, generally you're going to see the water recede uh, a lot farther out and you know it might not even seem like there's anything crazy going on or there's a lot of activity but if you just wait just a few moments you will see the waves start to rush in at such a great rate and we have mm. no we have no we have no power against huge water like that that 
heaviness, that magnitude of power and energy is something humans have been working with, never against, because we can't, we can never defeat the ocean. So uh, that's that, 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 that beautiful. Even with the Indonesian uh, earthquake, you know, the water went out 500 meters, you know, it went out an awful long way. And people, some people who didn't know what it was were confused and they sat there and walked out looking at it. And then of course, the tidal wave came back in again. And, you know, that was the end of them. And, uh, but we know this is a real account, that this is real, um, that it actually happened. This is real history. Because here we have five black swan events all at the same time. So a black swan event is something that's so unusual, so uh, unpredictable, that you could never dream of it happen. Uh, it, it, black swan events come from the discovery in the, when was it, the 17th century of uh, swans in Australia. Because we all know what a swan is. You know, a swan is a big white bird. Who would ever dream that there was a black swan? But of course, if you go to Perth in Australia, they have black swans. Something so outside your expectation that you could not invent it. And yet here with the um, the story of the Hyksos and the biblical story of the plagues and the exodus. We have five black swans all at the same time. You know, we have the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke. We have the ash fall, the darkness for three days, um, the tsunami, all in the same story. And yet who in, in that sort of era, Bronze Age era, would know that all of those five events were linked to a volcano in the Mediterranean. You, were, you couldn't invent it. It's just impossible unless you were there and this was an eyewitness account of what you had seen. It's the only way that could possibly be. And that pretty much proves that the plagues uh, before the Exodus is a real account. It's historical because it, it's explaining the eruption of Santorini in 1600 BC. And just 20 years after that, of course, we get the Hyksos Exodus. And the Hyksos Exodus is so close to the biblical narrative, it has to be the same event. The only difference between the two is, is like a 350 year gap. That's all you've got to bridge. If you don't mind bridging that gap, then we have discovered the Exodus uh, in the historical record, which is interesting because that it means that the account of the Exodus is probably historical. Okay, there are slight differences. You know, the, the patriarch shepherds that we all hear about in the biblical story were actually shepherd kings. That was the formal title of the uh, Hyksos. They were known as the shepherd kings. Uh, they have several titles because they, there's just different translations of the same name. So uh, the name comes from Haikal Kasut in the Egyptian, which means the, um, the kings of the mountains, perhaps, or um, the kings of foreign lands. But it also means the shepherd kings. And we know that because Haikal is spelt with the shepherd's crook. Um, so the transla translation by Manetho, this is a very old translation, it's not a recent one. Uh, it comes from the works of Manetho, who was a third century BC Egyptian historian who spoke Egyptian. So, I mean, he, he ought to sort of know. And he called them the shepherd kings. So they were both called shepherds. But of course, they weren't they weren't agricultural shepherds. This has nothing to do with, um, uh, with sheep and sheep rearing. Um, it's to do with the um, procession of the equinox. So it's, it's about astronomy. Um, will your listeners be familiar with procession? Yes, yes, they yeah, will. And I, I, have a, I have a quick question uh, yeah, to just re ahead. regarding this, because a lot of this sounds like, you know, there's a lot of Vulcan worship and a lot of like higher echelons of esoteric study. And you look at this, you know, this worshiping um, and this respect for the volcano gods and that they, 
are like this this inner family of uh, deities that they basically like run the inside of the planet. But there's also this Vulcan planet that is it's hypothetical, but I've spoken with a couple of astrologers asking them about it, and they do believe that the ancients did in fact believe this Vulcan planet was a part of the true astrological workings of some of the energy that was being uh, strengthened here on the earth and potentially when it's in orbit might actually have some uh, some power on the volcanic activity here on earth and I was wondering if you found any cross correlations with that or um, uh, and and maybe some other uh, I'm, I'm unaware of any other volcano gods actually I'm just only uh, Hip to Vulcan, but uh, wondering what your what your take is on, um, on on that. Well, no, I I don't know much about volcano, and I don't think it would be linked to any planet because I think that's a new name for that particular planet um, or hypothetical planet because it's mm-hmm, been discovered. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. they didn't really have volcano gods. I don't think volcanoes were that common in the Mediterranean, um, apart from a few sort of fumaroles. Uh, around Greece, and of course, um, Thera, Santorini. Um, But they didn't really know it as a volcano. It was just a a mountain that gave hot water and spewed steam and so on. Um, But we do have records from the Greeks uh, about this event, but they're not really interpreted normally about this particular event. We we have things like the, the Thalos, which was a great beast, towering beast um, that used to throw rocks and so on. And um, if if he cut his, his ankle, then the blood, the ichor of the gods, they called it, the blood of the gods used to spew forth like molten lead. Well, that sounds rather like a maritime volcano to me. You know, if, if you split the bottom of a volcano, quite often you can get lava under pressure issuing forth, you know, from the base of the mountain. You, you've probably seen, you know, all the pictures from Hawaii and so on, where it spews, the lava spews into the sea. That sounds like a very good description. Um, we also have the story of of the um, Argonauts and so on, and, and they were caught out in darkness for three days. Sounds similar. When, again, there were rocks being thrown at them and the the... the I think the ship nearly turned to stone and things of this nature. And they were completely lost in complete and utter darkness for three days. The gods were against them, you know. They were all just huddled in the middle of the boat, praying. And suddenly the skies parted and the sun came back again. And they're all worshipping the sun. And they came onto an island called, I think it was called Apne. Anyway, this particular island was... 20 kilometers away from Santorini. It sounds awfully like another story about the um, eruption of, of Santorini, which has been incorporated, incorporated, incorporated into many aspects of um, mythology. Um, because this was the biggest event, you know, in that era, in that region. Everybody would have known um, about the Santorini eruption in some fashion, wherever they were based, even if they only saw the darkness for three days, they would have known all about it. Um, and so, yeah, the description of a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke would be very apposite. So yeah, you think um, everybody knew about it. Uh, yeah, I think Sitchin in his books, when he's talking about the uh, Sumerians and the Anunnaki, he uh, tells of a story of a, a erupting volcano, and which is why uh, people had to leave their lands and whatnot. And there's like a change of power at that time in the in the mm. in the Mesopotamian story, so or the Sumerian story. So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. It puts a different perspective on on the whole Exodus story, and then this gets us. This story, I presume, gets us into uh, Skota, right? Because it's the Hyksos that are in Egypt, and then they have to leave Egypt. So, yeah, 
tell us a little bit about that and the and the two different Exodus types that they're getting confused here. Yes, so we we've just been through the main Exodus. I call this the Great Exodus, which is you know from history is the uh, Hyksos Exodus. Um, but there was another Exodus because we have this information from Manetho again. He's the third century BC. Um, Egyptian historian. So he was writing from a position of, you know, knowledge of that region. And uh, he clearly states that there were two Exodus events. So he goes through the um, uh, the Hyksos Exodus and he tells us of all of the problems that happened at that time. Um, but then he narrates a different Exodus. And this was caused by the um, Exodus of the 80,000 lepers and maimed priests. And again, this is not commented on very accurately from what I've seen in any of the sort of classical histories we read of Egypt. I think they've all misinterpreted what it what it's talking about. A lot of them treat this as mythology. I don't think it's mythology at all. I think it's real history. Um, it seems clear to me because this, this event happened at the time just after Amenhotep III. Uh, 18th dynasty. So we're talking about 1350 odd BC here. And quite clearly, he's talking about the Amarna dynasty, the dynasty of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. And so when, when he's talking about the 80,000 lepers and maimed priests who were banished to the east bank of the Nile, it's quite obvious that he was talking about the setting up of Amarna, the city of Akhenaten in the middle of Egypt, which was on the east bank of the Nile. And, you know, there's lots of people saying about you, you can't have 80,000 lepers. That's not possible. Even Josephus says that. I don't know why he was so stupid, uh, saying you cannot have um, priests in, in Jude, uh, Judaic priests are not allowed to be lepers, so they can't be lepers. And you can't have 80,000 lepers in one place. Yeah, okay. We, don't take this quite so literally, chaps. <laughs> um, of course, they were called lepers because they were theological lepers, not physical lepers. They were theological lepers. And of course, Akhenaten and his court, um, of course, they were regarded as theological lepers because they were going against everything. Um uh, Egypt had done over the you know the previous two three thousand years. He was upsetting the whole of the apple cart, defeating a, the names of the gods. I have a question for you. We just did a a, a slow burn on our our YouTube channel about leprechauns. Do you think that maybe these are the, the leper kings? Because uh, Khan means king. And do you think that maybe the Hyksos are the leprechauns? I've never thought about that, actually. No, I don't know the etymology of, of leprechaun. I don't know where that comes from. So, mm -hmm. no, I'd have to look into that. Some of these um, et etymologies do link up because a lot of Egyptian has crept into uh, Aramaic and from Aramaic into uh, Greek, you know, because the Greeks ran Egypt, of course, so they picked up a lot of Egyptian words. Um, and so, and those Greek words have run through into Latin and English. So we do get words that, that move through from language to language. Uh, one of the heresies that I've talked about a lot, which other people don't like, is that uh, Aramaic and Hebrew are a daughter language of Egyptian. So the Jews at present are still speaking Egyptian. Um, and there are so many words. I've, I've I've got a list of about 500 words that are similar or identical between the two languages. And um, I have this wonderful academic book, um, which is, is titled um, Aramaic Loan Words in Egyptian. And you think, hold on a minute. The Egyptians were the most dominant um, you know, power in this region at this time. Um, Who's going to loan words to who? It's going to be from the Egyptians to the uh, to the Israelites, not the other way around. You know, when people Im immigrate into America, they learn American. Okay, 
the Americans might pick up one or two words from them. But, you know, in general, it's the major culture, the dominant culture, uh, who imparts their language on, on immigrants. And that would have happened um, at this time as well. So, yeah, Aramaic Hebrew is a daughter language of Egyptian. And, of course, that would have happened because, you know, people like Joseph... Um, him of the coat of many colors, the Old Testament Joseph. Old Testament Joseph was the um, high priest and prime minister of all Egypt. He could not have attained that position without speaking fluent Egyptian, knowing all of the Egyptian culture, and probably venerating the Egyptian gods. Same with Moses. He was supposed to be brought up in the royal court, uh, he was a prince of Egypt, and according to uh, Josephus, he became the uh, chief army commander of the Egyptian army. You don't attain those positions without speaking fluent Egyptian. And, of course, from that, of course, then many of the Israelites would have spoken Egyptian. Uh, so This makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. Like, just so, speaking, like, when you just... The, the, the lineage of how things would progress through time, who would um, who would who would adapt to the language and, and further it along and change it and and make it their own and yeah that makes a lot a lot of sense that it kind of just blew my mind to be honest. Yeah, so I mean, it's just such a, a natural thing that would happen, you know, in every society. You know, when you get immigration, they learn the language of the dominant society, and so uh, Aramaic is Egyptian. So they're still speaking Egyptian. It just has a slightly different dialect. You know, it doesn't, you know, some of the words are pronounced slightly differently. Things like the um, Egyptians didn't have an L consonant. So they spoke it with an R. It's a bit like, who does that? Is it the Chinese? Yeah, the Chinese yeah. Can't, can't pronounce Ls and so on, you know. So yeah, you, you get differences like that. But essentially, the um, the modern Jews are speaking Egyptian, and the modern Arabic as well, because Arabic is a you know daughter language of, of Hebrew and Aramaic. Um, so yeah, so the there is a a long standing progression. Now so was going... Phoenician similarly developed at Aramaic, both stemming from hieroglyphs. I, I think so, because um, I've tracked, um, I've not done a great study into this, but from what I've seen, um, Phoenician culture came out of Egypt. If you look at their architecture, if you look at their burial practice and so on, it's all Egyptian. So I would have thought the Phoenicians would have spoken some sort of you know, proto-Egyptian language, uh, a daughter language of, of uh, Egyptian. And uh, it's from Phoenician, of course, that we get our alphabet. Our alphabet is, is Phoenician. And I think we probably got a lot of our uh, words from there as well, because they went, they settled Tunisia, of course. Uh, Tunis was Phoenician, and they went across the Mediterranean, so they would have spread that language into Greece and Italy and so on. So there would have been lots of contacts with the, between these different peoples. Interestingly enough, I mean, I was looking at um, Linear B, which was the original um, script and language of the ancient Greeks. Um, oh. And... Uh, and this was before on before the Phoenician influence on the yeah, language. Before the Phoenicians, oh. this was on Cyprus in the Minoan Empire. What's the name um, of this? Linear uh, B. Linear B. Now is that uh, still being used by the Berbers? Uh, well, possibly. I haven't looked into that, but I was looking into um, the history of the Minoans, and mm. they had some loan words that had come out of um, uh, Greece. And now I is that not linear A? Say again. I, I was I was uh, under the impression that the Minoans were using the language linear A, whereas the Berbers used the language linear B to this day. Uh, no, I mean uh, okay. these are scripts, not languages. So it, this is just a, a, a script for writing. You've got linear A and linear B, and on uh, in the Minoans they used linear A, then they used linear B. Um, huh? Linear A was more like hieroglyphs, and then linear B was more like syllabic writing, uh, right. which eventually evolved into the Phoenician script. But the language they were speaking 
uh, I only looked at about four or five words, and all of those four or five words could be found in the Egyptian dictionary wow. with the same pronunciation and the, and the same meaning. So that was interesting because Egyptian culture was not static in one region. It would have expanded out across the Mediterranean. This was, you know, the dominant superpower of the Eastern Mediterranean. And so if you're trading with Egypt as, you know, the Minoans with a great trading civilization, of course, they would speak a lot of Egyptian in that region and spread it around the Mediterranean basin. You would need to in order to do business and to do trade. Yeah, you would have to. You would have to know the language. Yes. Yeah, you would. And spread it around. And so I think a lot of Egyptian words have crept into a lot of the other languages, including, you know, uh, ancient Greek, Phoenician, um, and predominantly into Hebrew, Aramaic, and therefore into Arabic, which is a daughter language of uh, Aramaic. So, yeah, lots of wheels within wheels there. But we were talking about um, the setting up of Amarna. Um, we had this story about the 80,000 lepers and maimed priests who were banished to the um, east bank of the Nile um, into an area known as the, the quarry. <clears throat> the quarries on the east bank of the Nile. This has to be a story about the setting up of Amarna because Amarna would have been a quarry at this time, because there was nothing there. Um, Akhenaten, I'm not sure if he was banished. He might have been banished, or he might have banished himself just to get away from everybody else. Um, set up a new city on the east bank of the Nile, and it would have been a quarry because there was nothing there. He had to build a new capital city from nothing. Was uh, it a limestone was, quarry? Uh, most of it's limestone in, in uh, Egypt, but also a lot of mud brick of, as well, of course. And so we get this correlation with the, uh, you know, the Israelites having to make mud bricks. Um, the only problem is with that, that correlation between the biblical story and what, uh, of, of, uh, what would become the second exodus uh, and the story of Akhenaten is that the pharaoh that was ordering them to make the mud bricks was their own pharaoh. It was Akhenaten himself. Uh, but he was becoming a bit of a tyrant because he wanted his new city building in, in record time. And so he was lashing the whip at his people to go and work harder and make him his new brand new city uh, and make you know mud bricks, whether they have straw or not straw. There are a lot of correlations here that fit very nicely with this second exodus um, out of Egypt, because Manetho says there were two exoduses, the great exodus and this one, which is the smaller exodus out of Egypt of the 80,000 lepers and maimed priests. And that would have a correlation with, again, with a biblical story. Um, remember that in the uh, biblical story, um, the Israelites um, could not have uh, any male children because the, uh, all of the male children were being killed by the midwives, Shipra and Pua, um, when they were, you know, when the women were on the birthing stools, they killed any male child. And so the Israelites could not have any male children. Lilith. Well, Akhenaten never had any male children, did he? exactly in the same fashion. So he had six daughters, but mm -hmm. no male children, which is very, very unusual. Uh, and now from the biblical story, of course, we know why this is. It's because the two midwives, Shipra and Pua, were killing all the male children. So he had never had any sons. Was there any castration involved? Were they trying to maybe like mutilate any of the boys into making them women? Is that, was that a thing or part of narrative? Um, well, there was, and we'll come on to that. There was a lot of that in the New Testament as well. Um, but Akhenaten was probably castrated. Um, that's why later um, you see him portrayed uh, as being uh, androgynous in all of his statues, um, probably because he was castrated, because there was a, cast, uh, a cult of castration. It's not well documented in Egyptian history, but it is documented in New Testament history. 
Um, that's why um, that's why uh, Jesus, I don't know if you know this, Jesus asked uh, for his uh, disciples to castrate themselves. Um, it's not well taught, this one, not surprisingly, of course. Uh, Matthew 19, 12. Uh, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, there are some eunuchs who were born from their mother's womb. Uh, there were some eunuchs which were made eunuchs by men. But there are some eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to do it, let him do it. So Jesus is asking for his disciples to castrate themselves. Um, why? Well, because there was a cult of castration. They were known as the galley priests, um, or Josephus calls them the Galileans. And remember that Jesus and uh, Peter were both known as Galileans. And so they are likely to have been castrated um, because Josephus Flavius says that they were uh, castratos, and they dressed like women. They put on women's dress and women's makeup. And they were the high priests, uh, the galley priests of the uh, El Gabal, the sacred stone. So we'll come on to that later. But yes, there has always been a cult of castration. And we can be fairly sure this goes back into ancient history because the um, Nazarene, and remember Jesus and Saul were both Nazarene, um, they weren't Christian. <laughs> Jesus was not a Christian. He was a Nazarene Jew. That's why he had long hair and a beard, because the, um, uh, the Nazarene grew their hair long. Um, but the Nazarene venerated the primeval Adam. And the primeval Adam was uh, androgynous. At the very least, he was castrated, but he was probably androgynous. Um, he was the, the neither man nor woman. Um, I suppose you call him a demiurge. He wasn't the real God. He was like a secondary um, secondary God, a demigod. And this um, seems to be common, right? As you get to these like these uh, higher echelons of power and like being able to get in these higher spiritual like uh, workings, like you know, like the hermetic laws are seemingly all about true androgyny, either physically or philosophically, that that interweaving of both of, of that. So do you, do you think there's something going on playing with the, the true hermetic law here? I, I don't know where this, this comes from, because traditionally within Egypt and also within subsequent religions that were based on Egyptian religion, everything is about duality normally, because yeah. there was a duality in the heavens. Um, there was male, there was female, there was the sun, there was the moon. And the phallus all of the worship. Gods, yeah, all of the gods came in pairs. They came in men, uh, husband and wife pairs for all of the gods. Uh, you know, Thoth and, and um, oh gosh, what was his wife, Mart. Um, and so there was a standard duality. Um, but maybe the, the, you know, the... And androgynous gods maybe combined both of those elements together because the, they did have the nine, the nine great gods, and therefore one of the gods had to be, you know, maybe not man, not woman, because he was the extra person. Um, I don't know. There needs more study in that. I don't know why this cult of um, at least androgyny came around. Um, <laughs> but if you look at Akhenaten, he's uh, androgynous. This is why I did wonder. There's no no evidence for this, um, but I did wonder if the primeval Adam that they were venerating in the first century was actually Akhenaten. Because remember, in this new um, analysis of the Old Testament, Akhenaten was central to the story. He was a part of the second exodus. Um, so they would have known that he was... Um, a key character in this story, um, because in my analysis of this story in the second Exodus, um, we get these two very similar names. We get Aaron and his brother Moses from the biblical story, and we have Akhenaten and Moses from the historical st story. 
because the brother of Akhenaten was called Moses. And so we get some rather familiar names and events that come out of this. And, and so I think what's happened in the biblical story is they've coalesced these two exodus events together. Manetho clearly says there were two exoduses. The biblical story only records one because they've joined them together. Um, and that's why the biblical story thinks that this all happened in the Ramesside period, because that's, of course, much closer to the um, era of Akhenaten. But Akhenaten was most certainly, I think, pushed out on an exodus. Um, there is no evidence for his death in Amarna. Uh, his tombs was empty. The tomb of Nefertiti was empty. Um, and there were no magic bricks in his tomb, so it was never used. So what happened to this guy? I don't think he's anything to do with KV-55, the money, mummy they found down in the Valley of the Kings. Uh, KV-55 is too young in my estimation. Um, I think he went on an exodus. And we have this again from Manetho, who says that the the 80,000 lepers and main priests went on an exodus and they were pushed out and they went to Pyramasi, famous town again, except at that time it was called Avarice, uh, which was the uh, city of the Hyksos. Um, its original name was Avarice, but later on in the Ramesside period, it was called Pyramasi. So it's the same town. And Manetho gives this big story about this exodus of these lepers and main priests who were eventually pushed out of Egypt. And so we have the second exodus. But in Scottish history, coming back to your question about uh, Scota, in Scottish history, we have a third exodus. And this again is, is little known. Um, not taught very well, but in Scottish history, uh, this dates back to the 13th and 14th century by um, John of Fordun and Walter Boer from, you know, cold and windy Scotland in the medieval period, and they wrote the history of the Scots. This was a part of the Declaration of Arbroath, which is like the uh, American uh, document to what was your your independence document it's the same thing uh in fact a lot of people think that uh, your independence document was taken from um the declaration of our hmm. the declaration of our growth was trying to persuade the pope that scotland had always been separate from england and therefore they wanted to be independent familiar story yes yeah, same sort of thing mm -hmm. um and so in order to prove that, they went through the history of the Scots. And they said that the Scots were founded by a Scottish, sorry, a Scottish, an Egyptian queen and king from Egypt called Scota and Gaethalos. So this is Queen Scota, the Egyptian queen. And it's just interesting that the way they hang this into Egyptian history is via the works of Manetho again. So um, Walter Boer and John of Dunn must have had a copy of Manetho's History of Egypt because they copy it in, in quite a lot of detail. And they weave uh, Scota and Gaethlos into this in exactly the same period as we've been talking about, into the Amarna period of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, which is interesting because Akhenaten was the heretic pharaoh who had been deleted from history. He's not visible in any history. Um, you can only infer him, really, from the works of Manetho. And yet somehow these Scottish um, historians knew all about Akhenaten and the Amarna dynasty. And I have a question way, about Akhenaten. Yep. Is it possible that, that Exodus during his time was due to his declaration of monotheism and pushing out the priests of the other cults? Oh, yes, most certainly. Um, mm -hmm. He upset the apple cart completely. Um, so 
if people want to know what the um, Amarna dynasty of Akhenaten was all about, uh, all you have to do is watch um, Wild Wild Country on Netflix. Now, that is the story of a charismatic um, guru, I suppose you might call him, from India, who went to America and set up a new colony somewhere in deepest, I don't know, Nebraska or something, somewhere out in the wilds of Central America, <clears throat> Central North America. And all of the trials and tribulations they had of making a new city from nothing. Mm. And then after creating this new city, you know, based on this new interpretation of religion, of course, um, I forget who the um, leader was. It'll come to me in a minute anyway. Um, <clears throat> so then there start to be tensions within this community and tensions with people who are not in the community. They tried to poison the local town, of all things. Um, and then the uh, this community became a bit of a police state. So instead of being, you know, a, a happy-go-lucky hippie state, which it was initially started out as, you know, it was all free love and so on, um, it became a bit of a police state. Uh, and then there were tensions within the hierarchy, and then the whole thing dissolved, and they went on an exodus. <laughs> they were thrown out or threw themselves out. That story um, is exactly the same as the founding and dissolution of Amarna by Akhenaten and Nefertiti. It follows the same story all the way through. You know, the hardships of, of founding this place because there was nothing there. You've got to build it from nothing. And when they did the archaeology of the um, grave sites, they found that, you know, like 80% of the people were like working like slaves who had all got these um, telltale signs on their bones of really hard work when they were young. Um, so, and then, of course, it all dissolved you know, internal tensions, tensions with the outside authorities, and the whole thing dissolved and they went on an exodus. It's exactly the same story. And yes, of course, there would have been a lot of outside tensions because Akhenaten was going around, he closed down all of the old temples. Mm -hmm. So all of the old temples dedicated to the old gods, you know, Isis and Ra and all of those traditional gods of Egypt, he closed them all down. And he was going around cutting out the names of all of the old gods. Can you imagine what would happen in America if, if a president came in who sent the army around to every church, um, you know, knocking down every cross and cutting out the name of Jesus in every church? Wouldn't be terribly popular. <laughs> so, yeah, of course, there was lots of tensions. Um, and far from being a happy-go-lucky hippie, um, Akhenaten must have been a tyrant in order to get his army to do that, because that's a very unpopular thing to do. He wasn't trying to be Mr. Popular here. He was ruling with an iron fist, you know, no doubt. And so, yeah, there was a lot of opposition, and there was a lot of people very joyous when he got kicked out of, <laughs> of, of power. Um, I have a, I have a few if, questions for you yeah, <clears throat> sure. before we move on here. Uh, so the Hiskos were uh, basically some Hebrew Israelites that came into Egypt. Uh, they got enslaved in Egypt. Then they kind of, uh, they left Egypt for Armana, or they, they set up a city I, of Armana. Are the Hiskos part of no, Armana? No, not quite. So... They never became slaves. So remember when the Hyksos came into Egypt, this was circa, you know, 2100 BC, quite a long time ago. They were actually the superpower. Mm. So they came in and they had weapons that the Egyptians simply didn't have. Um, I think Egypt was, you know, so concerned about religion that they didn't concentrate on their military very much. Same when the Romans came in at later and the Greeks, when they came in, they were defenseless against the Greeks. They were defenseless against the Romans. 
and they were defenseless against the Hyksos because the Hyksos had the composite bow, they had the chariot and all sorts of things and the horse that the Egyptians didn't have. Um, so the, the Hyksos took over Egypt and became pharaohs. They are pretty much indistinguishable uh, from Egyptians, apart from their focus on uh, Seth more than the other gods and so on. Typhon, as he's called in, in Greek. Um, so they were the dominant society. So it's a bit odd that they were kicked out, but of course this does happen. Remember, you know, Britain in, in India, we were the dominant society, but eventually we got kicked out. So this, this thing does sort of uh, happen. Okay, so... So all the way up until... Yep. So they set up Armana and then... Um... No, no, not at this time, no. No? So okay. um, this is all the way through to 1580 BC when they were thrown out on the uh, Great Exodus. So they went, to, they went out and they were pushed out to Judea and I think to some of the Mediterranean islands as well, which is why we get these seeds of um, Egyptian sort of culture settling in, in Greece and, uh, you know, Crete and various other places. But then we have the story of the coming back into Egypt. This is the Joseph story, mm. with Joseph coming back into Egypt. And remember, uh, in the Joseph story, um, Joseph says specifically to his brothers, do not say you are shepherds. Say that you are bull breeders. Otherwise, you will not be allowed to stay in the lands of Egypt. What was he talking about? This had nothing to do with agriculture, yet again, which is how it's portrayed, of course, if you ask any theologian about it. Nothing to do with agriculture. It was, don't say you are shepherd kings, the Hyksos, because shepherd kings are an abomination to the Egyptians, and you will not be allowed to stay in the lands of Egypt. Why is that? Well, because they had just had a civil war with the Hyksos shepherds. And so, of course, you could not mention that you were a shepherd king coming back down into Egypt. So they came back down into Egypt. Uh, this would have been circa, I, I don't know, 1400-odd BC, something of that nature. And there's fairly good evidence from the works of Ahmed Osman um, in his stranger in the Valley of the Kings, that Joseph was Yuya. And Yuya was the patriarch of the Amarna dynasty. And that sort of makes a lot of sense, that Yuya was coming down back into Egypt, having been thrown out, you know, 300 years previously. Well, no, not that, only... um. 150 years previously, um, they were now coming back into Egypt and setting up the Amarna dynasty, um, circa something like, I don't know, um, 1380 BC or something of that nature. And then we have what becomes the Amarna dynasty. We have Amenhotep III, and then Amenhotep IV, who is Akhenaten, and he is the one who sets up Amarna. Um, so this is the, the second coming, as it were, of the um, Hyksos people. They were coming back into Egypt. Um, but it didn't last long, because what was the Amarna dynasty? It was only 30, 30 years in total or something, something of that nature. Not, not very much. So we have the Amarna dynasty. Um, Akhenaten and Nefertiti get thrown out of the country on the second exodus. They institute, well, then we get Smenkara, who only lasted like two years. We don't know who Smenkara was, but he was probably sort of like a, a cousin of uh, Akhenaten or maybe a nephew of Akhenaten, something like that. He only lasted a couple of years. And then we get Tutankhamun and a restoration of the old gods. So quite obviously, the old dynasty found this prince and re-established him as Pharaoh only if he worshipped the old gods. So we have a restoration of the old dynasty and the old gods under Tutankhamun. But Tutankhamun was not very healthy. Um, he appears to have 
uh, several congenital deformities. He may have been run over by a chariot. Anyway, for whatever reason, he died after only eight years. And then I comes running back to claim the throne. So I was the army commander for Akhenaten. Now, he had gone on a minor exodus himself. He had exiled himself uh, from Egypt during the uh, Tutankhamun period because he was an artonist. He was not of the old gods. I think he went to Greece because we have this story of... Um, we have this story of this uh, prince or king who went to Greece, um, Danus, uh, who went to Greece and founded Greece at this time. And then as soon as Tutankhamun dies, of course, he runs back to Egypt as fast as he can to claim the throne. And he becomes Pharaoh I. And he is the one, if you look at the tomb of Akhenaten, uh, sorry, if you look at the tomb of Tutankhamun, the person officiating over the burial of Tutankhamun was I, Pharaoh I. I've got a suspicion that he might be the father of Tutankhamun, or at least he was very closely related to this, um, uh, to the Amarna dynasty. And he became the next pharaoh, but he was an artonist again, of course. So he again threw out the old gods and reestablished the Arten as being the predominant god of Egypt. So, but of course, this wasn't um, this wasn't very popular, and so he got thrown out. So you don't think that four years? You don't think Tut was the son of Akhenaten? Uh, I no, I was older, um, so I was was quite an old person. So he would have been the generation before uh, Akhenaten. So he mm. was a venerable old man when he became pharaoh. But he married Akhenaten's daughter and mm. Um as they all did. Remember, Akhenaten married three of his daughters. Mm -hmm. um, so, and Kesselman had an interesting marital history. She married her father. Then she married Tutankhamun, who was probably her cousin or something of that nature, very, very close relative. And then she married I, who would have been something like her uncle. Because um, in the history, it tells us that Tut is Akhenaten's son. Sorry, who is? That King Tut is the son of Akhenaten. Oh, yeah. Um, no, Tutankhamun can't be the son of Akhenaten, because there is no way in the world that Akhenaten could have had a son and not acknowledged him. Right. I, I find that just um, incomprehensible. Yeah. Even if it was through a second wife, you know, through Kia or someone like that, one of his second wives, um, he would have um, acknowledged a son. And of course, within the biblical story, we have the story of the midwives, Shipra and Pua, mm -hmm. who are killing all of the Israelites. Yeah, that's why I asked. Yeah. 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 No, I think he was something like... His nephew? Yeah, it was, it was something like a nephew. So uh, Tutankhamun, initially, I thought he was a son of Pharaoh I. And I is closely linked to this uh, Amarna dynasty as well. Yeah, apparently um, his mother was possibly a sister of Akhenaten. Yeah, something of that nature, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, certainly he's very closely related. The, the genetics uh, says that he is closely connected. But remember, the, the genetics is a bit um, tenuous because there's a lot of broken genes in this. You know, we're talking about mummies that are 3,000, you know, 200 years old, you know, that a lot of the genetics is all sort of broken up and garbled a little bit. Yeah. But I don't think he was a son of Akhenaten. Yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned how he didn't have any sons earlier. Yeah. Um, he never acknowledged any sons. So mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think Akhenaten could have had a son. He had six daughters, and he, his six daughters are, are there in every scene. You know, he's always kissing and hugging. There's daughters everywhere and not a single son. I and then don't think uh, he could have had a son and not acknowledge them. Maybe he smoked cannabis 
So I know <laughs> any of the smokers are likely to not be able to have sons sometimes. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Especially if well, he smokes sons. They might have done because they, they certainly did have cannabis running around in those days. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a mummy they found that was stuffed full of cannabis, one of them, which was quite odd. Wow. That's um, um, and uh, which, so anyway, which mummy was this? <laughs> Ah, oh, it was from a later era. I forget when this mummy was, but uh, yeah, it wasn't quite this era. But yeah, mm-hmm. um, so we, we, we're fairly sure that they did have cannabis uh, in that in that time. Um, but anyway, this this story from Scotty Chronicon, uh, which is the ancient chronicle of the Scots, indicates that the people who went on this third exodus, so now we have another exodus were actually Pharaoh I and and Kesemun, and Kesemun, his wife. These are the people who went on the third exodus because, again, they were unpopular. Um, they had gone back to Artanism. Artanism was not very popular. People wanted a restoration of the old gods. And so they were kicked out of the country. But they weren't just thrown out, you know, like in a battle or something of that nature. They were actually told to leave, you know. Either you leave or you will be destroyed. And so they left on their own terms. And apparently from Scottish history, they were given 60 boats and told to go wherever they want. So they loaded up their ships and sailed off to the west. And within Scottish history, they say that this king and queen, um, uh, so that would be I and Ga- and uh, I, who's Gaethalos, and Ankesanamun, who is Queen Scota, sailed off and landed in Spain, on the east coast of Spain, on the Ebro Delta. And um, so... They established a colony on the Ebro Delta, which is interesting because that is the only other delta within the Mediterranean. So Egypt, they had been working and living in the Nile Delta. And so they would have been very, very familiar with farming in the Nile Delta. And they managed to land on the Ebro Delta, which is the only other delta in the Mediterranean, which they would have been very familiar with and able to Um, farm very easily. And they were there for a few generations. Um, And they went from there to the Balearic Islands, you know, Menorca, uh, Mallorca, which is just off the coast there. Um, But they were always being harassed by the locals. So eventually, they sailed to Ireland. And that is why Ireland was called Scota because the original name for Ireland, in, if you look at any ancient sort of uh, map of Ireland, it's called Scotia. And that is why Scotland and Egypt, uh, sorry, Scotland and uh, Spain have the same name. So Scotland is called Hibernia, and Spain is called Hiberia. And according to Scottish history, this came from the son of this king and queen, her, who was called Heba. And um, the, the sons, again, yes. this is all said to be, um, it's said to be just mythology, of course. You know, this is, you know, it's not true. It's all mythology. But the two sons of uh, uh, Gaethalos and Scota were called Hymek and Heba. Which, okay, they're just two names, and these are supposed to be made up names by, you know, by a a, a Scottish monk in a Scottish monastery. But those names in Egyptian mean river and sea. How would they know that the Egyptian words were river and sea for these two sons? And this is where the name for the Ebro River comes from. It's supposed to be from the son of Queen Scota, who is called Heba. And that's where we get the name for the Ebro River from, which is the river that runs into the Ebro Delta. Do you think this is where the Hebrews come from also? Well, that is that is a possibility as well. That, that was commented on by um, several people who have looked at the story. Um, 
Don't know on that. It's possible. Um, they do mention the um, the Hebrew Exodus, the Israelite Exodus, and interestingly, they link it up with the reign of Akhenaten, which is interesting. So not Ramesses, like you know, the current thought from you know theologians is that it's linked to the reign of uh, Ramesses. Yeah, they link it up to the time of Akhenaten, hmm. um, which in my research would be the, the the correct time that's when it should have happened um so yes we have this story and then we have to think about well is there any history behind this story is it in any way true or is it just pure mythology um have they made it up well i think there's quite a lot of history that indicates it may well be true um, so what I did is, is I followed various things, artifacts and religious sites and temples that have gone through these regions that seem very similar. And um, the, the first one I saw was the uh, Nevitas, they call them, the uh, upturned boat tombs, which are on Minorca and uh, Majorca, which is where they were supposed to have gone to. Now, if you were escaping somewhere by boat, one of the first things you might do is drag some of those boats up on land, cut them in half, turn them upside down, and you've got immediate lodgings for this new proto-society. I mean, they might have had 500 or even as much as 1,000 people on 60 boats, so this would be quite a large community. Um, but in these sites, you find these upturned boat tombs, which are made of stone, of course, but that would be logical for a society who had arrived by boat. And then, of course, if we go to Western Ireland in the Dingle Peninsula, what do we find? We find upturned boat tombs in the same fashion. Um, and then we find uh, truncated towers. We have truncated towers in, in uh, Minorca and, and uh, Majorca. And then we go to Ireland, and again, we find the truncated towers, uh, which I think were sort of like um, religious sites. They're too small to be defensive. Um, they're not practical because there's no rooms inside them. So people say they might be lookouts or something of that nature, but I think they're sort of uh, religious monuments. They are sort of temples of some nature. Are those the bastion forts, the star-shaped forts? Well, some people call them forts, but they're not very good fortresses, really. I mean, there's no room inside them. You, you can't keep any people inside them. The only thing you could do is stand on the top of them, maybe, and throw rocks at people. But yeah, these are in big complexes as well. Uh, they don't strike me as being defensive positions. So if you look at the north of uh, Minorca, you get these big uh, sort of like megalithic stone circles almost. And in the middle, there will be a truncated round tower. It looks religious to me. I think what they may have housed, because some of them have like a small hole in the middle, but not a room, not big enough to be a room. I think they might have been plant pots, which might sound odd. But if you look at Minoan culture, they did have the cult of the sacred tree. And they also had the cult of the sacred tree in Egypt as well. If you look at some of the um, Hyksos um, uh, palaces uh, up in the Nile Delta, they had sacred gardens with rows and rows of sacred trees in these gardens. And we don't quite know what tree they were using, but they did have sacred trees and sacred groves the same as they do in Israelite religion. You look at the Old Testament and they were always had sacred groves where they used to tie uh, bits of material on, on the twigs. So you get these trees covered in tassels of fabric. And there was always this pogrom against sacred trees and they were trying to cut down all the trees because the Israelites shouldn't have been venerating trees like they were. So... Um, yeah, the cult of the tree was quite strong. And I think these some of these round towers, truncated round towers, might have housed a sacred tree. 
just as we see with the Minoans. Um, they have coins, well, not coins, um, like medallions and rings. Uh, and you can see trees growing out of truncated round towers. Now, would they have had uh, any vestiges of irrigation there? Uh, in, in the Menorcan one, yes. There's, there's a, uh, a small gutter that runs underneath it, which would have watered it if there had been a tree in the bottom of that particular round tower. The, it, it had a, a source of water as well. Um, and these are, again, I don't think these can be defensive just because of the number of them. If you go to Sardinia, which again, another island in the Mediterranean, they have uh, truncated round towers. What do they call them? They call them navitas, do they call them? Anyway, um, they've got 6,000 of them. Wow. Now, either Sardinia must have been the most lawless place in the whole world <laughs> to have this number of fortifications, or it was a religious site, and they were very religious, and I think it's the latter. These were religious monuments, and they've got all of these thousands of truncated round towers all across Sardinia. Um, you think their history was misinterpreted, or possibly they were re-inhabited later and used as forts for militaristic purposes? No, I think they are purely religious, apart from the one of them in Sardinia, where they've put five of them together, oh, wow. and it sort of looks like a fortress. Um, you know, with walls in between it. So maybe, uh, as you say, uh, at a later point, someone thought, well, actually, this if we join them up together, maybe that might make a fortress. That's the only one that's like that. And they've joined them together with a wall, and it sort of looks like a fortress. It looks like a medieval fortress, but this is from the um, Bronze Age. <laughs> this wow. is going back in, back into history a long, long way. Um, I know some historians... So the impression that they uh, came around after the uh, straight-walled castles fell out of uh, favor because they were easily hit with um, with uh, um, catapults and the yeah, walls yeah. were down. And so they made these other uh, truncated towers with walls that were kind of slanted earthen walls. Yeah, um, they had problems with this. Yes, straight walls are not very good, as you say. They're easily knocked down. They need very big foundations. What they used to do in the Hyksos, because the Hyksos were militaristic, they were, they were quite a militaristic uh, society, they used to make a glacis. And a glacis is a slope. And that might seem odd. Why do you want a you know, nice friendly slope all the way to the top of your fortress? But it's actually a very, very good fortification because this glacis is made from paving stones. So it can be a little bit sort of on the slippery side. It's going up like at a 45 degree angle. Um, very difficult to get a footing on a 45 degree angle climbing your way up. And it means that the people on the top of the fortress have a clear view of you all the way down. You can't hide underneath the wall because there is no wall to hide behind. You've only got this slope in front of you, which is very easy to fire an arrow down this slope at whoever is trying to come up this glacis slope. They call it a glacis because it, it comes from glacier. It looks like a glacier. Um, some of them were painted white as well. Oh, wow. And that was the defensive position that they had in uh, the Hyksos in the Nile Delta. Also in the Nile Delta, another reason for this is they didn't have any natural stone um, because the Delta is um, alluvial material. There's no stone there. So if you want to bring stone in, it has to come in by boat. And that makes stone very, very expensive. So you can make a glacis of mud brick and then just put a few stones on the you know, outer course and suddenly you've got a fortification without using very many bricks. Um, and I was, um, I was in Anatolia on, on my journeys. Um, I, I did a month in Anatolia and uh, Egypt just um, a couple of months ago. And we were at an <clears throat> ancient fortress in Anatolia. Um, oh, yes, this was the Hittite. So this was uh, Hattusi. 
um, in central Anatolia, the great enemy of the um, Egyptians. And um, the guide was there. I, I, I was there as guest speaker, and but we have to have local guides. It's one of the um, one of the things you must have. And he was saying that this is. We don't know what this is because this is not really part of a fortification. You know, we have this slope of material, and then we got to the top of this fortress and looked down, and there was a glacis. It was a pure glacis, so it was a fortress, despite what the guide was saying. And yes, it was, it was, you know, a, a very good fortification. I proved that by getting some people down at the bottom to try and run up the glacis, while others stood at the top and looked down at them. And of course, they're right in your field of view. You know, if you've got an arrow, they're dead meat. You know, so it, it is a very good fortification. So yeah. Um, that's fascinating. Sure. I'm also interested in uh, what trees they might have worshipped then. Maybe the cedar tree. I know the fig was very prominent in spiritual worship. I don't think it would be the cedar because that would grow too large. That's true. I, I thought that. Oh. I, I was thinking maybe, and, and it doesn't look like a cedar when we've got the images of it. Um, right. I thought it might be the... Um, the olive, because the olive was yeah. very important to the economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the fruits they were picking, the fruits don't really look like an olive. Um, they look more like a strawberry, sort of triangular sort of affair. And I don't know what tree would have a fruit. I don't know if that was just a symbolic representation, but uh, it didn't look like an olive anyway. So I, I don't know what trees they were venerating. But it wasn't a conifer. Um, it wasn't a tall, straight tree. It had branches that came out from it. Okay. Um, yeah. That, I, I did ask um, some people um, in a, um, what do they call it? The big um, botanical society in London. Anyway. Um, and they didn't sort of know, and they weren't really sort of interested, so I really didn't get a very good reply from them. But it would be interesting to uh, to see what tree they were venerating, because mm -hmm. it was obviously quite important. Um, so, yeah, that's the trees. Um, the other similarity I thought was interesting was um, uh, in Ireland, they have all of these wonderful gold talks, and um, which is a necklace. And I know, oh, we cannot screen share. Okay, never mind. I was going to show you a quick picture. Um, if you go to the Dublin Museum, which is a really good old-fashioned um, museum modelled on the uh, British Museum in London, try it now. And it's oh, okay, it's. A let me quickly show you this. So, if I share that one, can you see that? Yeah, so we have a gold necklace there. Uh -huh. And wow. they've got many of these in, in the Dublin Museum. And here's another one. And this is a mystery because there is no gold in Ireland. Um, the, there's very, very little native gold. There was no evidence whatsoever of smelting gold within Ireland. <clears throat> this has to have been traded and brought in. But Ireland has been perennially poor, you know, for, for the last, you know, 3,000 years. What would Ireland be trading for such expensive goods as these gold talks, necklaces? Um, it's always been a mystery how on earth these talks ended up in Ireland. Well, one way is they could have been brought there by the original people who uh, settled these lands who was supposed to be Queen 
Skota and King Gathalos from Egypt. And they are identified with the Amarna dynasty. And of course, if we go to the Amarna dynasty, we find that the currency they used, because they didn't have money in those days, but obviously gold was recognized as being of value. And so what they used to do is not give coinage to people. Akhenaten used to give gold talks. And here is Akhenaten and Nefertiti and his one, two, three daughters. And what are they doing? They're giving out gold necklaces, gold talks, which look very, very similar to the ones we find in Ireland. Yeah. And here is I. This is I when he was the army commander. So he was the army commander um, for Akhenaten before he became pharaoh. And he's receiving those gold talks. He's being given them by Akhenaten and Nefertiti. And he's already got one, two, three, four, five, six round his neck, and his wife uh, has got the same. Um, the currency in those days was the golden talk, and those gold talks look very similar to the ones we find in Ireland. If I could just, so uh, I, I just sort just of describe these torques real quick they're big yeah, giant sure. um, so crescent shaped looking pieces of gold they don't really look like a necklace per se as we would think of a necklace now they're very thick very big yes it's like a collar almost isn't it it's mm -hmm. it's, it's like um you know a um a christian dog collar from a priest but much much bigger and fatter so they're they're quite substantial. It's not just a small necklace. Um, this... And it, it obviously goes round your head, and it would go halfway down your chest as well. You know, they're, they're so big. This kind of relates um, to the, huge... the leprechaun thing, too, of, of if, the, if they were the leper kings and the leprechauns uh, brought, they, they guarded the gold that was in Ireland. And if Ireland didn't have any, where did the leprechauns get the gold? Yeah, I don't know the history of um, <laughs> Ireland to that degree. It would need someone who's very familiar with Gaelic history to have a look at this and see if they can yeah. tap into some of this information as well. We'll, we'll report, we'll report back to you after we get through our right. few okay. months of, uh, of Gaelic mysteries. But that is really interesting because uh, synchronistically we're just kind of going in on a deep dive of the leprechauns, and uh, that's it's kind of a fun mm. uh, fun twist on things. But... It, but um, yeah, the story itself had like basically been contorted after um, you know the Christianization of Ireland, and and so the the, the the understanding of leprechauns now is completely different than what it might have been back in the day of an actual like just a mystic king um, of higher echelon of esoteric wisdom. Oh yes, they've they've changed their stories quite a lot, and they probably would have have to have done under Christian rule anyway. Um, and there's an amount of, you know, Chinese whispers as well at the same time where, the, you know, the stories get garbled somewhat. But, you know, a lot of this history actually comes out of Ireland. It's not just Scotty Chronicon gives this story, but also the Labor Gabala, which is the, you know, 6th century um, stories coming out of Ireland that report the same sort of history um, of Gaethelos and Scota coming to Ireland. And from Ireland, they then went to Scotland, of course, which is why Scotland is called Scotland after Queen Scota. Um, <clears throat> again, that's said to be a, a, a back formation that Scotty Chronicon has, has used the, his, the uh, name for Scotland for that queen rather than being the other way around, that Scotland was actually founded by that queen. Um, but, you know, why would why would the Scots want to make this history of coming from Egypt of all places if if there wasn't a kernel of truth in the matter? You know, why to go to somewhere as obscure as Egypt um, to say that your founding fathers came from Egypt? It's not the first place you would um, expect you know that you would you would come from, um, and in. This story is somehow also linked up with the um, 
the story of the um, Troy and, and the Trojans as well. We get some of that history comes into this. So it's an interesting story, and there's a number of elements from real history which indicates that some of this might be true. I go through. This is my book, Scota, the Egyptian Queen of the Scots, um, which is um, yeah. Uh, I got some more I questions for you. If, yeah. Sure. Uh, so, so your belief is that Akhenaten is actually Aaron, and Moses is his brother, and so we see this Akhenaten and Aaron thing in the Bible, and also Aaron seems to be the uh, high priest or the protector of the Ark of the Covenant. Is there any yes. Ark of the Covenant type stuff going on in in this exodus to Ireland? No. Um, however, there is a story of the um, Ark of the Covenant goes through into the New Testament in, into Edessa. Um, <clears throat> so this is, is a part of my New Testament studies um, where we see the Ark of the Covenant coming into that story via the history of the sacred stone of Egypt, which was the Ben-Ben stone. Um, Is that Jacob's pillow also? Get... Yeah, it's Jacob's pillow as well, which I've recently translated as being um, a Ben-Ben stone, exactly okay. the same. So if you read that verse about Jacob's pillow, uh, it's actually talking about an omphalus stone upon an altar. So, is this, uh, and of course, what does Jacob do each morning? He gets up early in the morning, and he bastes this stone with oils. Yeah. Now that's interesting because that's exactly what they do in India uh -huh. with the uh, sacred lingam stones in India, which are the same shape as the uh, sacred uh, omphalus stone of of Egypt. And they do exactly the same. They wake up uh, each morning very early, the priesthood, and they clean and baste the stone with oil. And that's uh, a Hindu lingam stone. So, and so there's this very close similarity here between um, Hinduism and Judaism, because Jacob is doing this with his stone. And in Hindu religion, they do exactly the same. Because I thought, Perhaps this this history of the Lingam Stone came from Alexander the Great, you know, three hundred odd BC when he went across to uh, um, India and, and, as it were, became the king of India. Um, but now we have Jacob doing exactly the same thing. And Jacob, you know, if he was the Hyksos Pharaoh uh, Jacoba or Jacoba. Um, he would be going back to sort of like um, seventeen hundred. BC, a long, long time ago. And yet we still have this similarity between Hinduism and Egyptian religion at that, uh, and Israelite religion at that stage. Um, so, so the stone that they say that's in Mount Tara in uh, Ireland is not the actual uh, stone, you don't think? Oh, because no, that's a flat stone. Of it. That's a flat stone that's in the chair. Ah, oh, no, I was thinking of the one um, at Tara. I think it's at Tara. They've got um, um, a conical sort of stone there at Tara oh, as do. well, which is, yeah, that's the shape it's supposed to be. Okay. So it's supposed to be shaped like a, like a modern lingam. If you look at a lingam stone, it's sort of like a uh, conical sort of stone. And uh, that's the shape it's always been throughout ancient history, um, because from the Benben, -Ben, which was again conical um, and linked with the um, uh, with the phoenix, it had the phoenix standing on the top of it. Um, it went to Greece, and so we have the Greek omphalos stone from Delphi. So you can look at the uh, omphalos stone of Delphi, and you'll have a couple of varieties there. Again, they're copies; they're not the original. Um, and again, conical stones, one of them covered in netting, which is interesting because we don't know what the netting is. 
Um, that has similarities with the pillars from the Old Testament uh, of Yakin and Boaz, um, again from the Temple of Jerusalem. The two pillars uh, of Yakin and Boaz that stood in front of the temple had um, spheres of the earth and the sphere of the cosmos on each one of them. So they had two spheres on the top of them. So they knew that earth was spherical and they were covered in netting. Well, that's exactly what we find at Delphi. If you look at the Omphalos at Delphi, it's covered in netting. We don't quite know what the netting is, but anyway, we'll go into that perhaps in a, in a bit. I think it might be um, a coordinate system, lines of, um, yeah, sort of like that, yes. <laughs> um, yes, I don't link it with that, but it does look very similar. If you look up the um, on Phallus of Delphi, you'll see what I mean. Um, but from there, it goes to Parthia, it goes to Persia. And I think it went to Persia with Alexander the Great because Alexander the Great became the king of uh, Persia when he took over Persia. And we Roman, got what it was on the their name? coins. What was the name of the picture you just shared? What mushroom was that? Lady Mary. Um, yeah, that's uh, the Veiled Lady. Veiled Lady veiled Mary lady. Mushroom. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's super... Uh, unique mushroom but it has like it like mushrooms are like lingams or they're phallic and then you have this whole phallus worship thing but he just brought the, the netting and I was just like that reminds me of this mushroom that I know of that's super fascinating yeah perhaps that was the inspiration I don't know I, I tend to think that most of their religions look towards the cosmos more um, and that's why I think it's a coordinate system for the cosmos because they mm -hmm. do know lines yep. of latitude and longitude uh, but this stone ends up in Persia, and we've got lots of coins of it. If you look up um, um, Persia coin um, Apollo Omphalos stone, you will find lots of um, coins with this stone on it. And again, it's a conical stone covered in netting again, um, just as we find at Delphi. Um, and from there... It fades out when we get to the first century, and the reason it fades out is because of the um, because of the gospel story. But we'll come on to that later. There was an exodus. It's amazing how number of, the number of times these monarchs get thrown out of the country. But a monarch of Persia, Parthia, uh, got thrown out of the country in AD four, and her name is Queen Thea Musa Orania. We'll come on to her later. She was the queen of Persia, and she got thrown out, and she went to Edessa and set up a new city-state there called Edessa, which is in northern Syria. And they were reputed to have the Bethel, it's known as, the um, Omphala stone, at Edessa. But at Edessa, it's cubic. And if you read any sort of stories about this from classical history, it'll say it's a cubic omphala stone. But no, it was known as a Bethel. A Bethel is a house of God. Um, and it's got feet underneath it. And you can see it sitting on a chariot in one of them. It's quite obvious that this um, cubic or rectangular um, artifact was the Ark of the Covenant. It's a box. That's why it's called a Bethel, the house of God. It's a very small house of God, but it's a house of God nevertheless. And what did we have in the um, Ark of the Covenant? We had some sacred stones. That's what Moses put in the box. And so what we have at um, Edessa is the Ark of the Covenant with sacred stones in, inside it. So again, the, the stones were obviously not very big. We, we're not talking about huge stones. At the most, they could only be about, you know, two foot high in American terms, something of that nature. Otherwise, they would be too heavy because in Rome, we have them sitting on chariots, so they can't have been that heavy. So this stone went to Edessa in northern Syria, first century. And then in the second century, going into the third century, we find the same stone down in uh, more central Syria, uh, 
at Emesa, slightly different place, but central, near Damascus, basically. And we have coin images again of this Omphala stone sitting in a temple. Again, it's conical. Again, it's linked with the uh, phoenix. It's embossed with the image of the phoenix on it. And here, it's known as the um, El Gabal. So it has a different name now. Um, and the El Gabal means the mountain of God. The mountain of the sun god, no, nonetheless. And so um, I wonder if I've got any little images of that, just so we can show what we're actually talking about. Um, Does any of this um, correlate to the later Scottish story of the Stone of Destiny that sits under the throne of the royal, uh, royal court? Yes, because the Scots say that they have it. So eventually... Oh. Yeah. Eventually, this stone ended up in Scotland. But before it got to Scotland, it went to um, Rome. And I'm just scanning my images to see if I've got any. Interestingly enough, all of these places generally have a lot of phoenix symbolism or the double-headed eagle, where you see... Um, you see that, you know, the, the eagle or the phoenix wearing the crown holding the swords. Uh, potentially a globus crucifer as well. So it's almost like wherever the stones go, that phoenix symbolism, like it's, oh, which is interesting because the phoenix uh, generally can like, you know, is kind of like the philosopher's stone to, uh, and uh, in a little bit of terms, or but that's rising from that's the ashes, rising from the ashes and going to these new locations and setting up new mm -hmm. cities and new, Oh, the new and Heliopolis. And so it's... Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was and, also and known the as the prime... It was also known as the primeval mound, the original mound which uh, emerged from the waters of the... Uh, um, uh, of the celestial waters of Nu, from which we get Noah. Mm. And this was the primeval land, the first part of of order and creation that came out of the chaos of new this comes from egyptian uh theology this is their sort of foundation genesis myth and here we see um just so you can see what we're talking about here here is uh, the phoenix standing on this original uh primeval mound they call it this is the benben uh so we've got this bird standing on this thing that looks like it looks like a little mountain actually um, here is the Delphi Omphalos, and you can see it's a small conical stone, not very big. It's only about, it's less than two foot high. Here's the ones from Parthia or Persia. And this is Apollo, who's sitting on this conical stone with this um, lattice of netting on it, as I said. Um, here is here is the one from, oh, let me expand that so you can see that. Here's the um, rectangular one from Edessa. This is an Edessan coin, northern Syria. And here you can see it's actually a box. It's not a stone. They say this is a stone in a temple. But if you look underneath it, it's got little feet underneath it. Uh, this is the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant contained sacred stones. So it was at Edessa. Uh, this is the one in Syria. A bit later, this is second come third century. And here from a Syrian coin, we can see this conical stone again. And you can see the image of the phoenix on it. That's a bird. That's his body and two wings on either side inside a temple. That is the, um, they now call it the Omphala stone. And from there, it was taken to Rome by Emperor Elagabalus. So there was an emperor. This is Elagabalus. Um, and he was the mad emperor who was a galley priest. So he was a eunuch. He castrated himself. He was um, very famous for castrating himself um, because he was a galley priest. And he was a priest of the Elagabal stone. The galley priests looked after this sacred stone. And here you can see he took it to Rome and it's in a chariot. Again, it's conical, small stone. 
embossed with the phoenix. You can see the phoenix embossed on the side of it in a chariot being drawn by four horses. This is the Elagabal stone. This is the sacred stone that has gone all around these communities from Egypt all the way back to, you know, at least sort of 2000 BC, all the way through to El Gabalus was about 220 AD. So for more than 2000 years, 2200 years, this stone has been going around and it was been venerated by many, many people uh, in many different locations. Have I got a better? Here we go. Here's a better image of it. There we go. There's the stone. Um, many people have known about this stone. Um, it disappears after the reign of Alagabalus. He, he wasn't best liked, so he was murdered after about four years. And, um, and we don't know what happened to the stone after that. It disappears from history. But people still do know about it because I was sitting in a, in a, uh, a cinema a few years back watching James Bond, of all things, you know, as one does, you know, um, a rip-roaring James Bond movie. And then James Bond is captured, and he's taken into this meteor crater, which is actually in, um, I think it's in Tunisia. Or, no, it might be in Morocco. Anyway, it's in North, North Africa somewhere. So he's taken to this lair of the evil man in this uh, crater. And he goes into an observatory um, that he's, they're taking it in for absolutely no good reason at all. I don't know what this had to do with the story. And there they are taken to see the Omphala stone. <laughs> so here's the El Gabal in a Bond movie. Wow. For no good reason whatsoever. Wow. <laughs> I forget which Bond movie this was. And it's a Did you have an because... epiphany uh, in the cinema? Did you see that and almost gasp and people looked at you like, what, what's, what's I, going on? <laughs> I did nearly fall off my chair, I must admit. I was quite astounded because this Omphala stone, the Elagabal, was supposed to be a meteorite. That's why it was special. That's why it was venerated by the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Parthians ah. and, and the Odessans and the Syrians. It was supposed to be a meteorite. And lo and behold, what do we have here? We have <laughs> an omphalus-shaped meteorite uh, in this film for absolutely no good reason. It had nothing to do with the story. And then we have this speech from the, you know, the, the guy who ran this evil empire saying, this is the oldest stone in the universe and things of this nature. And you go, well, what's that? I think that was Skyfall. Movie Skyfall. Skyfall. It, it could have been. I don't know. It's the yeah. one where they were running around North Africa, and they ended up in a big crater in North Africa. Um, so yeah, whatever that one is in, entitled. Now, is it possible that this netting was made to have it look like a pine cone, represent the pineal gland? I know there's a connection between the pineal gland symbology and the. Oh, um, um, I was going to ask the same thing. I, I don't know. What I, what I think it was something to do is, let me see if I can, oops, no, I don't want that. I'm looking more for, this one. So if I stop share and then reshare, I can go in with a different screen. This comes from masonry, Freemasonry. Um, this comes from Freemasons Hall in London. So this is Grand Lodge in London. But remember Freemasonry, it just comes out of the Old Testament. This is all to do with the building of the you know, Temple of, of, of Solomon. And so here is an image for people who can't see this of the two pillars that stood before the Temple of Solomon, which were known as Yakin and Boaz. And um, the, so we have two pillars, and they were surmounted by the globe of the earth. So again, they knew that the earth was, um, was spherical, and the globe of the cosmos. 
And you can see they're divided up by lines of latitude and longitude. Um, and in the Bible, let's see if we've got another image of this. Uh, no, we don't have that. No. In the Bible, this is described as netting. So if you do a, a you know, a, just a, a general Google search for pillars of Yakin and Boaz from the Temple of Jerusalem, you will see that quite often they just have netting put on the top of them because that's what it says in the Old Testament. Um, and I think that is similar to what we see for the Omphala stone, that it is, is it's draped on with, with netting. And then the question is, what does that netting represent? And here in Freemasons Hall, they've interpreted uh, the netting as being lines of latitude and longitude. And as and with the hermetics involved, uh, you know, that's as above, so below. So it basically coordinates to astrological lines in the matrix of the stars and understanding those stories too, eh? Yeah, yeah, because that's exactly what uh, astronomers will do. So we have lines of latitude and longitude on the Earth, and astronomers, when you look up into the sky, they do exactly the same to divide up the sky in, into, you know, sections so you can identify where each star is and so on. Um, I think that's probably what they were talking about, but uh, we don't know. It's all a bit of a guesstimate, but, you know, that's my best. Fascinating. Uh, you know, I was just yesterday speaking, trying to describe to my mother, and I'm visiting my mother right now, which is always really fun because after, you know, <laughs> gathering all this really awesome uh, 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 information and wisdom from all, all of you amazing people, researchers, authors, and, and the gloriousness of the show and just gaining a bunch of great info, I get to spill it upon my mother. Anywho, <laughs> um, I, had this, I had this revelation of like, the, I was trying to describe to her why the Freemason symbol had the G and it has the compass and it has the square. And I was saying, it's, well, it's funny that the compass itself is an angular point, but it's one of the only things that can draw a perfect circle when all it is is made up of lines and angles. Yet the focal point itself, when you take it, if you were to take it from your body and your energy and shoot it straight up and you create one arm of the compass and it directs back down, then you like have this almost like spiritual, spherical thing being created. And I think that has a lot to do with um, some of like the Masonic belief system, you know, of this rotating Ouroboro of energy of just, you know, the magic circle, also Solomon's magic circle as well. And it's, it's, and it's, it's this is beautiful. You're blowing my mind with the, with the netting and the, yes. the latitude and longitude. That's well, beautiful. The, the point in the circle is, is central to masonry. It's, it's one of the fundamental symbols of masonry. Um, and it is an, uh, an, an image of the God, as it were. So it's, it's a circle with a point in the center. Uh, the fundamental point, I think they call it. Um, interestingly, it's the hieroglyph for the sun god. So in Egypt, of course, everyone would have known that the point in a circle is, is um, symbolic of the sun god. So yes, of course, it is symbolic of the deity. Um, yeah, and it's drawn with a square and compass. And everything within masonry is to do with uh, building technology and so on building symbolism, because that's what they were doing. They were building the um, uh, Temple of Solomon for King Solomon, and they were all architects. So it's interesting that um, the center of this um, society is not someone like a king or a priest or a prophet. Um, the central character in masonry is Hiram Abif, who was an architect because he was an architect on the earth, but as you said, uh, as above, so below, God is the great architect of the universe above, in the heavens above. And that's why they have the G in, in the center for um, masonry, because it means the great geometrican, the great architect of the universe, which is why my first book was called Thoth, Architect of the Universe. Um, that God is is a demiurge, I suppose you, you could call him. He is a designer God who designs the universe, not just oversees it, but actually creates things. 
I think possible. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Romy. Um, no, Andy, you go. You go, sir. Uh, do you think it's possible that the net could represent uh, containment, um, having to do with the fact that the secret societies are well contained? Their information is kind of netted from the masses, from the public, um, or possibly represent um, protection. I, I I don't know. Um... To give you a clue, because there, there is no answer to this. I mean, it's all guesstimates. <laughs> the, the netting in the uh, Delphi Omphalos is created from seashells. Oh. So it's maritime. Uh, it's, it's like a fisherman's netting, but it's made of seashells and various things that look like shells. Well, they look like shells, but we're not quite sure. I wonder if, if they... Fascinating. It makes I, me think I wondered if, if they were representations of, you know... Uh, planets, stars, and, and uh, galaxies. Um, Bay lines, dragon lines. Yeah, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, in Scottish history, because they say that after this stone went missing from um, Rome, which would have been about 220 AD under uh, uh, Emperor Elagabalus, um, that it ended up in Scotland as the Stone of Scone. Now, they say... And there's no evidence for this because they've never shown the stone. I did go to, because I'm, I'm, I'm a Freemason myself, so I went to a Templar meeting at Roslyn Chapel uh, up in Scotland. And the, the um, master there said that they have it and it has the power of levitation. And so they produced a video not a real one, it's just, you know, CGI, of this stone that levitated itself. And that's what they say the Alagabal is. But, of course, mm -hmm. no evidence, just, just a, a little video clip, you know, two minutes long of this levitating stone. Um, so I don't know what to make of that, but that could be another reason for netting, you know. So that it doesn't float away. The cosmic, the cosmic fabric, you know, the the weaves of uh, of reality to to mesh in uh, the blanket that sits over us and creates the universe yeah. and the and the being. Uh, I'm wondering about through your years of extensive research and writing, which is absolutely amazing, and every minute today has been just complete awesomeness, but what um, type of um, magical workings have you come across um, in ancient Egypt and um, that might be associated, that we consider magic, that maybe they didn't consider magic, they just maybe considered God? Um, loads of it, loads. Um, I can give you a couple from the New Testament because, of course, all of these traditions flowed through into the New Testament. Um, miracles, then, most of those were magic or they were technical they were scientific so the, the famous one is is jesus turning water into wine that was Heron of alexandria and i don't know why people can't admit to this so in the first century we have Heron of alexandria who was the uh leonardo da vinci of the first century so he was known as the mechanicos i think the machine man and he made all sorts of things including a steam turbine back in the first century. Um, it's called the Aleophile, I think it's called. And he made all sorts of things. He made uh, fire engines with pumps, and he made birds that sang, and temple doors, automatic doors, all of this sort of stuff. But his favorite thing he liked to make, and remember a lot of these things were made to amaze the aristocracy and the royalty and the priesthood. Um, his favorite thing was making trick jugs that turned water into wine. And then we have Jesus turning water to wine in the same era. It's quite obvious that this was a trick jug made by Heron of Alexandria. And they were technical, of course. They were scientific. They had two compartments. Um, and it was organized by putting your hand, putting your thumb over holes in the handle. And through siphonic action and, you know, differential pressure and uh, water surface tension, uh, you could pour out one, one compartment or the other compartment, depending on what you wanted to do. So you could pour out water, and for the next guy, you could pour out wine. You turned water into wine. It was just a standard, wow. 
kind of <laughs> <Yeah>. trick. <laughs> and yet every, we still have the original design drawings. It's not as Didn't if he, this is a big secret. <laughs> <laughs> did he Heron was he the water did he make the water organ or he was yes. worked a lot with liquids, right? This guy? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. He did a lot of that. Yeah, he made a water organ, all sorts of things. So it's quite obvious that Jesus was a very important person because he was. He was a king, he was a monarch, and he had bought one of these magical jugs in order to entertain the people at his wedding. Uh, that's what it was all about. And then the other famous one that uh, we find, not so much in the New Testament, but more in the um, Clementine recognitions, was the story of Simon Magus, who was supposed to be the chief magician of this era. Um, so he's comparable with Jesus. They said that Simon Magus only does his tricks through trickery, through magic, whereas Jesus did miracles. Uh, yeah, okay, what's the difference? Anyway, one of the... Um, miracles or tricks of um, Heron of Alexandria was he could conjure up a little boy. And this was a real talking physical boy. Well, not physical, because he was a manifestation of a boy. He wasn't real. He was a spirit of a boy. And it's quite obvious that he had a camera obscura. Wow. Now, a camera obscura is... Literally, camera obscura means a dark room. So all you need for this is a dark room with a hole in one wall and a very bright courtyard outside. And you can project the image of whatever is in the courtyard onto the back wall. And it's, it's a perfect camera image. Now, we're used to this because we go to the cinema, we have televisions, we know what images look like. But if you can imagine being 2,000 years ago in a room and seeing a television quality image of a boy standing outside projected onto this wall. And he's a real boy because you can say, boy, hold up your right hand. And the boy will hold up his right hand. And he moves, he talks, you can see his lips moving because it is a photo quality image. If you, if you get it right and, and get the whole just right, it's a photo quality image of whatever is outside. And that would have been absolutely amazing to people. You could knock their socks off if they ever wore socks in that region. They probably <laughs> didn't, sandals then. Um, the classic smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Um, the only thing is the boy would be upside down. So if you wanted to make this real, you would have to hang the poor boy upside down and then he <laughs> would be standing the right way up in, in the image <laughs> in the room. Um, but these are quite amazing. They had them in the Victorian era, obviously before the advent of television. People again, I suppose they'd seen pictures on uh, pieces of paper but they'd never seen moving pictures in that era. And so it, they used to have these in the Victorian era. And they enhanced it a little bit by putting a lens in there, but you, you don't need the lens. And they used to have them at seaside resorts to amaze the public. And it did. And we still had one. Last time I went there was just 10 years ago. We used to have one at a seaside resort near me which was still there from the Victorian era. You know, this was an ancient piece of <laughs> um, entertainment for the, for the masses. And instead of showing what was just outside the door, it showed, it projected an image of the town below. So it was situated on a bit of a hill and looked down over the town. And then it projected this image onto a sort of um, uh, a dish-shaped um, bowl in the center of this room, and you could walk around the outside of it. And in this bowl, you could see all of the cars driving up the road, you know, the people walking down the promenade, the waves breaking on the shore. It was all there, just like a television uh, screen or a cinema screen. But that was just through a camera obscura. And I think that's what uh, Simon Magus had back in the uh, first century. They knew all about these things. And um, they had them the great, to... Great use for, like, talk about magical divination or um, being able to cast some sort of um, 
whatever, whatever your intent is, if you were to gather images of somebody and have them in a bowl and then to put your stones in there, or your workings, or fill it with water and do whatever. I mean, um, I think in the Harry Potter series, they had kind of this, uh, this bowl of memory where you were oh, able yes. to go in and put your memory into this. It's almost like seeing this, seeing something inside of a bowl is, um, or water scrying was, I think, done similarly. So I think maybe even using the Camera Obscura, it was fascinating because I've actually done some, uh, some research on the Camera Obscura because I was very into the history of optics, mm -hmm. but I was unaware that it was being used <laughs> any time before the, the 14th century at least. So that's, that's really yeah. fascinating. Um, well, I, I'm pretty sure people would have known about it because it, it happens naturally. Um, and the first time this happened to me, I'm, I've only ever seen it twice. I was quite amazed by it. So you can, you can discover this by accident. So I was in a hotel in um, uh, South Australia, very bright outside, of course. You need it to be bright. And it was a bit of a rundown hotel, and the uh, curtains uh, were all threadbare, especially along the top where they hung from the curtain rail. And so it had a series of holes along the top of the curtain. Um, I didn't think much about it uh, until I woke up in the morning, and I had the whole of the road below was projected onto my ceiling. So I had all of the cars running across my ceiling and all the people walking on the pavement all on my ceiling all formed from this very, very natural camera obscure, which was just the holes in the curtain, had formed a camera obscure just by accident, completely by accident. And so I'm sure this must have happened in the ancient past, and people have seen these images and thought, hey, that's interesting, especially if you're, you know, one of the priesthood. <laughs> that's, that just gave me an image of... Uh... Sometimes when I look at the stars, I'm like, this has to be a sheet with holes poked through and there's light on the other <laughs> side. And it's almost like if those were tiny ob obscures to the heavens, they could be projected everything that's happening here in the heavens, <laughs> in the heavenly realm. Well, th this was the role of the priesthood. You know, the priesthood had to, f to earn their position. They had to have knowledge that the people didn't have. Um, so knowledge of how the universe worked. So you could say that this star is going to go over there next week because it's a planet and you, you know the movements of the planets. You know the times of eclipses. So you can say that next week there will be an eclipse and everyone's going to be totally amazed because there is an eclipse next week. Um, you can say that the sun is going to come back from the south because it goes you know towards the south during the winter and then it starts coming back. The solstice, the time that the sun stands still. All of this was, was how you derived your power. And then, of course, you derived your power by prophecy, by using the constellations above. This is what Joseph was doing, you know, him of the coat of the many colors. He was a prophet, and he was doing divination by using, um, quite obviously, you know, the, the stars above. And he was prophesying for the pharaoh. That's how you gain your power. You say, you know, next year, um, O oh, oh Prince, O oh Pharaoh, there will be a famine next week, uh, you know, or a flood or whatever it happens to be. That's how you gain your power. Um, that's how climate scientists gain their power today. It's exactly the same. All they ever do is they forecast doom and gloom. And they're bound to get it right sometime because something's going to happen, you know. Ah, you see, if we've got a flood. I predicted a flood. And then, of course, three months later, you've got a drought. And they say, ah, you see, I predicted a drought in the same place. <laughs> you see, I predicted that. Give me some more money and some more grant money. You know, that's what people, <laughs> that's what people perfect, do, isn't it? Perfect that's... cycle right there, right? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like this year, you know, because I'm, I'm into climate. I'm a climate scientist anyway. And uh, this year we had <clears throat> banner headlines, hottest summer ever in Britain, caused by global warming, caused by too much CO2. And you think, hold on a minute. We had three hot days. That was it. 
in a year which was otherwise very, very normal and pretty cold, uh, we had three very, very hot days. And that was it. And they called it global warming. Um, <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> Don't buy that one. Anyway. That's another hobby horse of mine. We won't get started on that one. <laughs> yeah, where, where did... Uh, That's a whole other whole other conversation. <laughs> where did we kind of leave off with the Skota story? I know we've uh, been asking questions. Um, a little sidetrack there, but... Well, that is sort of, I suppose, the end of the Skota story because okay. we don't have any cast iron information that can say whether it's true or not true. So what you... we have is a story, an improbable story, by some medieval Scottish monks, mm -hmm. uh, chroniclers, uh, who made up this, made up, who had this story, wrote about it, and it seems to accord with what we know of a lot of real history. So there are a lot of tenets of truth that underlie it that a medieval person shouldn't really have had access to in northern Scotland if there weren't elements of history to this story. Um, so I think there are some true elements to this story, and it's a very interesting one. Yeah, so for I sure. So I write it about is. it in my Skota, Egyptian Queen of the Scots. So, yeah, it's an have, interesting story. Do you have more on the uh, Mal Mal Malesians and uh, Goidal Glass and uh, their when, when they landed in Scotland and their... Uh, their kind of conflict with the Tua de Danon? Yes. Uh, well, we get that mostly from Irish history. I go into a, a, it a little bit, but it's very fragmentary, their history. It's very, it reads more mythical than Scotty Chronicon does. Mm -hmm. um, so it's difficult to get real information about it. Um, but they do have things like, um, the story of the red hand. Let me just have a quick look at this. Somewhere here I have. Yeah, here. So again, just for you, because obviously listeners won't be able to see this, but I'll just quickly do a screen share. Um, they have the story of the red hand in Irish history, which became the flag of Northern Ireland is the red hand, mm. the red glove. Um, and that comes out of very ancient history um, within uh, the Labor Gabala, I think it is. And note the red hand is inside a... Um, Star of David as well, because he's connected with the Exodus. And that's the flag of Northern Ireland, still is. You can still see it everywhere in Northern Ireland. This is a, a bank in Northern Ireland, and you can see it has the red hand on it. I meant the, the Star of David uh, with the red hand. That's... Well, they equate the arrival of the um, Irish with the Exodus story. So, oh, so the so, seal of Solomon in there as well. Yeah, they link it up wow. with the um, uh, with the Star of David of, of the Israelites. Part of this sort of lost Israelite story that you have. What is the red but hand? The interesting symbolism? thing about the red hand is that the other place we find the symbolism of the red hand is at Amana with Akhenaten. So Akhenaten is giving out all of these uh, awards to I, um, Commander I, as he was then, which are all of these golden talks, these necklaces he was giving out. And But one of the things he gives to I is a pair of red gloves. And according to the text on the side of these images, the thing that everyone was most amazed by was the red gloves that he got. And we don't know the symbolism of that red glove that was given to I. And then, of course, we go across to Ireland and we find the image of the red glove is one of the uh, central symbols of Northern Ireland. So, I don't know. Fast. 
fascinating. When, when you say the Pharaoh I, how do you spell this? How do I look this up? Um, he's spelt either A Y or A Y E. Pharaoh I, A Y E. There's and a, he's the Pharaoh after Tutankhamun. There's a lot of this red hand symbolism too in petroglyphs across America. Hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, there's another avenue of research. Yes. Yeah. But this symbolism, I mean, tracking these these symbolisms um, can provide lots of information. You know, we have because symbolism is very powerful and it it, it transcends. Um, cultures and millennia and goes down through history. Um, so here we have the standard image of Mary, uh, Mary the mother. We know that because she's dressed in blue. Uh, and she's standing on the moon with 12 golden stars around her head. This comes from the book of Revelations. Um, it's a standard sort of imagery of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And of course, what did they choose for the EU flag? Oh, <laughs> they chose exactly the same imagery. <clears throat> the 12 gold stars on a blue background um, come straight out of the book of Revelations. She also has um, red, reddish so, hair. Yeah, of course. Yes, she is ginger. Um, I don't know if people know this, but we have the history of the uh, ginger monarchy. So no. most of the pharaohs of Egypt were ginger. Um, it's not made. Let's have a look. So, uh, top right on this image is Ramesses the second, Ramesses the great, and he's got ginger hair. And people will say, oh, that's just the mummification process. Well, no, because he's his mummy was taken for preservation to Paris, and they took it to the um, forensic laboratory in Paris, where Professor Calcaldi um, did an investigation into his hair, and he said it is true ginger. It's not caused by chemicals on the hair. It's a true ginger. Um, so he was ginger-haired with ginger wavy hair. That's Ramesses the, Ramesses the Great. If you look on the left, uh, this is Yuya. Yuya was the patriarch of the Amarna family, and he is ginger. And so was his wife as well, Thuyu. Thuyu was his wife. And if you go now and have a look, they're both in the Egyptian museum. They are both ginger, very ginger. Uh, bottom left is um, Cleopatra. This is an image of Cleopatra VII, the famous Cleopatra of Egypt, and uh, she is ginger. Now, this is a very early image because this comes from Pompeii. So this image was buried in AD 76. Is it 76 or 78? Anyway, wow. whenever um, the mountain blew its top in Pompeii and buried the city, um, so this image comes from only, say, you know, 70 years after, maybe even less than that, after the death of Cleopatra. And she's portrayed as being ginger. This is the ginger monarchy, um, which is, you know, it may well be why many of the uh, English monarchs, of course, are all ginger. You look at Henry VIII, Elizabeth I. Uh, if you look at William, William the first, William the Conqueror, he was ginger. William R Rufus, he was called so Rufus because he had red hair. So this red, red um, the red glove symbolism might be like a homage to, if you don't have like the genetics of like the red hair, but you have like the red glove or you hold the seat in the power of the red glove, then maybe you're paying homage or you are in that, that family of Red hair, even though you might not have mm. the red hair. Wow, it's, that is fascinating. And wow. this guy in the, the right bottom right uh, side here, this is Muhammad al yakubi And he is supposed to be the great, 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 however many greats you have, direct descendant of Muhammad. Now, if he's correct, <laughs> then Muhammad was also ginger. 
And the Hadith say that, you know, this, the Hadith say that um, they had hairs of uh, Muhammad uh, because he used to give hairs out to, uh, um, what, you know, the various imams and, and uh, mosques and so on uh, in later years. They used to be given trimmings from his beard and they were ginger. And of course, Muhammad al Yukubi is very ginger. He looks like a Scotsman, doesn't he? <laughs> he looks very, very Scottish. So. He's got yeah. pale skin, freckles, and um, uh, and he's got a ginger beard. Um, yeah. So we have um, what I've called the ginger monarchy. That a lot of these monarchs from Egypt and from the Near East flowing through perhaps with the Scota exodus into Ireland and Scotland, of course. We know the Irish and the Scots tend to be ginger. Um, now, were they ginger that flowed down into England to give us our ginger monarchs, or did they get their ginger uh, genome from Egyptians, from Scota and Gaethalos? We don't know. Apparently, Ishmael was thought to maybe have red hair, and Muhammad was descended from Ishmael, so could I thought, go back. I thought Ishmael was 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 descended from Muhammad. <laughs> no? uh, the other way around, Muhammad descended yeah. from. Ishmael. I think Ishmael was one of his cousins or sons or something. Um, okay, from which we get the Ishmaelis. The Ishmaelis are the uh, Twelvers, um, and they worship. Ishmael, of course, or venerate, you can't say worship. Um, I thought, unless I'm truly mistaken, I thought he was um, a descendant of Muhammad. You could be uh, right. I know Esau was also said to have had red hair. Yes, absolutely. And That's so did uh, yeah. King, King David as well. King David was said to be red. Uh, does this he was connect, said to be ruddy. Does this connect later into uh, King James and the Jacobite or the Jacobite? Uh, revolution and is the Jacobites uh, Jacobo? Well, yes. I mean, they got their name, of course, from the biblical texts, and the biblical texts mention Jacob. Um, but you know, if Jacob was a Hyksos pharaoh, then Jacob was Egyptian. He was Hyksos, and so they're naming themselves after Egyptian pharaohs. And of course, the Jacobites were all ginger, of course. Now, that is supposed to have come from the Norse. Um, that's where we are supposed to get our ginger uh, monarchy from, because the Norsemen, the, the Vikings, as it were, um, took over northern France. So the Normans in northern France are not French. They are the Norsemen, the Normans, the Northmen. And so they are Vikings, and so they had ginger hair. And it was the Vikings, uh, the Normans, who uh, invaded England in 1066 with William I, and of course that's why he was ginger. And so we have the establishment at that time um, of a ginger monarchy. But we might have had a ginger monarchy from before then, because we had the Saxon invasions in the 6th century. They would have been blondish or gingerish as well. So we have uh, quite a few strands of ginger. And from those monarchies, we have the standard monarchy of the Tudors. The Tudors were all ginger. Uh, hence, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I were all ginger. And we had William the um, William the Third, who was a Dutch king, who became the king of England. Uh, he was um, ginger as well. And the Dutch monarchy are all ginger, of course. If you look at the Princes of Orange uh, in, in Holland, they are all ginger. Now, that's interesting because they came from France as well. Um, <coughs> I link this in with the exodus of Mary Magdalene uh, because Mary Magdalene uh, fled to France. And so I do this book called um, um, Mary Magdalene, Princess of Orange. And um, so she ends up in, in southern France. Now, Martha, she goes with Martha, 
um, because I don't know if you know Mary and Martha, the Bethany sisters, they were sisters. So Mary of Bethany was Mary Magdalene. So Martha goes to Tarascon, which is in southern France, and becomes the princess of Tarascon, where we get the fearsome beast known as a Tarasque, um, which was a glyptagon. If you look up glyptagon, that's what a Tarasque is. <laughs> so obviously they must have had um, um, fossilized remains of, of a glyptagon because that's what they drew. Anyway, the town above that is orange, which is interesting because ore means gold. It's referring to orange. It's referring to ginger. And um, I think Mary Magdalene set herself up at, in orange in the south of France because we have this separate monarchy in orange. We have this separate pr principality uh, in the south of France known as the um, <clears throat> Principality of Orange that was ruled by the Princes of Orange because they came from a town called Orange. And they had this separate principality there for a thousand years, more, until Louis the Fourteenth um, in France, who was a Catholic, kicked them out because they were Protestant. They were more, they weren't Catholic, they were free thinkers. And so they were kicked out of Orange. Uh, and where did they go to? They went to Holland. And that's why the monarchy in Holland is known as the Princes of Orange, because they came from Orange in France. Yeah. And they are all ginger. And so the people of Orange must have been ginger. Um, Mind so blown. Ginger. Yeah, oh my that's crazy. Uh, Roman has to Roman has to leave right now uh, because the the place he's at is filling up with people. Uh, Roman, do you have any last questions uh, for Ralph before you jump off? I mean, um, I don't necessarily. I mean, I do, but not any that could necessarily be uh, wrapped up quickly because. Uh, yeah, the, because they're also beautifully deep, but I love this orange thread that we are going down because this connects so many dots of the hidden history and that hidden glove, if you will, and the exoteric, the, hand. and the esoteric hands, the hidden hands, and it's absolutely beautiful. It was an honor uh, speaking with you today, sir, and I hope that we can do it again. Yes. yes. Well, thanks for being there, Roman. Thanks for all your questions. Yes, thank you. Yeah, this is fascinating, and, man. And very quickly, this leads us on to Mary Magdalene. Shall I continue just for a little bit? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, because she was supposed to be ginger as well. That's why she's always portrayed in um, uh, medieval type um, imagery oh, as being right, ginger. Yeah. And so here we have, let's start with this one. Uh, so again, for listeners who can't see this, this is an image of the Last Supper table with Jesus uh, and the 12 disciples. This is from Drogheda in Ireland. So this is a Catholic cathedral. <laughs> All made Ireland. of alabaster white rock. Yes. So this is um, high relief carving. And who is that sitting next to Jesus? This is the St. John character. What does St. John look like? Looks like a woman. Almost has boobs, too. <laughs> Looks like Princess Diana, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, how on earth could that be a man? That's that's not a man. That's a woman. It's even got a bust. Look. Um, so it was always known that the disciple on the right hand of Jesus was actually a woman. Um, let's look at another place. This is... Um, now, what's that? <laughs> this is from uh, Finland. This is from the capital of Finland, the old capital, Turku, wow. way up in Finland. Now, what is that, St. John? <laughs> is that female or what? Totally. <laughs> totally and utterly. That, that's a woman on the right-hand side of Jesus. Okay, at the Last Supper table. Um. 
Wouldn't all of the men, wouldn't all of the men or most of the men at that time, wouldn't they have had a beard? Uh, Or no? Yes. And of course, St. John, they always say St. John is is rather effeminate because in all of these (laughs) pictures, uh, well, sculptures and pictures, you can see that the person on the right-hand side of Jesus does not have a beard. (laughs) Yeah. And here on this one, this is um, Napoleon's uh, Last Supper table. So this was commissioned by Napoleon Bonaparte. One would have thought he would have some uh, say in how it was composed and who was going to actually draw this. Well, actually, I don't think it was drawn. I think this is a mosaic. It's it's very good, actually, as a mosaic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, And who is that on the right-hand side of Jesus? This is a direct and absolute copy of um, Leonardo's. So all of the characters are in exactly the same position as in Leonardo's drawing. Now, who's that on the right-hand side of Jesus? Let's zoom in and have a look. Oh, look at that. (laughs) Is that a woman or what? (laughs) Again, beardless. Got a beard in this picture, though, in this painting, Uh, to the right. Yeah, there's another one. Oh, yeah, but that's another of the disciples. That's... uh, Yes, but the disciple to the right of Jesus is distinctly beardless, long blonde ginger hair. Again, this is why I was bringing this up, because Mary Magdalene is always supposed to have had ginger hair. Um, And we know it's Magdalene because look at her cloak. Mm -hmm. She's in the green and orange or the green and red. I don't know if um, listeners know, but there is a color code here. There's a uniform that goes with these women. So if you don't know who the woman is and you're looking at a picture of Jesus or something or something in a cathedral, if she's in blue and white, that's Mary the mother. If she's in green and gold or green and red, that is Mary Magdalene. And so according to that uniform, um, here is Mary Magdalene. Look at this other one. Oh, look, she's in the green and the red again. It's Mary. <laughs> it's Mary Magdalene. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So the disciple to the right of Jesus has long been known to be Mary Magdalene uh, because she was his wife. That's who he married at the wedding at Cana when he had um, the magic drug. <laughs> drug, magic jug from Heron of Alexandria uh, that turned water into wine. That was his wedding at the wedding at Cana. Mm. Um, Yes, so yeah, you can glean a lot of things from symbolism. Yes, for sure. Uh, Yeah, we'd love to have you back to do a Holy Grail episode and get into King Arthur and some more of this. This kind of sets that up really nicely. Um, yeah, this has been really fascinating, Ralph. Uh, dude, I'm so glad you came on the show today. Uh, this has been a a lot of stuff I've learned, uh, from this episode. So, um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah. It's, it's all new material. Um, isn't it? So (laughs) this is what I like about my research and a lot of my followers like about my research, This is new material that you will not have heard from uh, classical authors, from theologians, or even from the alternative authors. I mean, we've seen many, many of those, Um, even the Da Vinci Code type, you know, other authors. You won't find this material. It's all new material, but it's all taken straight from the original manuscripts. So I don't go on, I don't read other other authors uh, of of any type, really, apart from uh, uh, classical sort of archaeologists and things of that nature. All of this comes from the original documents, the original manuscripts. So I read it. I read it in my perspective, which is a non-theological perspective. So I'm just looking at the history. I 
don't care what the outcome of that history is. I just write it as it is. And it forms a cohesive story, which the original story never did, because it never made any sense. You know, with all of these people missing from the historical record, a lot of it seems very mythical and esoteric and very strange. But it can all be digested and reinterpreted in historical terms. If you know that these people were important, quite often they were pharaohs, quite often they were kings, like the Jesus character, we'll come on to him later, um, who are the very people who people write histories about. You know, you don't write histories about carpenters, you write histories about kings and queens. Um, and it all makes a cohesive sense. So it all joins together. Uh, I liken it to a jigsaw puzzle where uh, you've got loads and loads of pieces. And if you were just fitting pieces together at random, they would not fit. My pieces slot into each other very, very nicely, and they form a cohesive picture. So all of them tend to create a cohesive single picture of this history about one group of people, basically, because it all comes down to, you know, pharaohs of Egypt and their descendants. We'll come yeah. into this on the New Testament, why this guy was descended from Egypt. Um, it's a story of one particular royal family down through the ages, down through the millennia. Um, it is their day book, basically. Uh, in Egypt, they used to keep a day book, which was the um, book of the royal court which detailed not only the major events that were happening, you know, for that pharaoh, but also some of the trivia of the royal court, you know. That's what this was. It was the day book of the court of the Hyksos kings. And later on, the united monarchy of, you know, David and Solomon. It was telling, recording everything that happened during that dynasty. And that's what we've got fascinating i don't know if if you know it but you kind of set us up uh we've been doing ancient america and there's some ideas of egypt being in america and this whole idea of uh that you just presented of of these of the Akhenaten dynasty kind of going to ireland it almost seems like maybe that they came to america too because we have some uh petroglyphs of snake symbolism with hands and um horns on their head almost like they look like vikings of some sort or whatnot uh most people in the ancient alien community get them associated with these ancient aliens that came to visit but when we look at from a historical perspective it definitely seems like they were people from another land that were coming here that were farmers you know uh, like the Hiskos were farmers, they were shepherds. So it puts a lot more things into perspective because a lot of people believe that Egypt was in um, the Grand Canyon area of America and because, and the, they f are tending to find, or there's mythologies about finding Egyptian artifacts within America. But if it was, uh, and there's also uh, our good friend Adam Stokes talks about uh, some Hebrew Israelites uh, that commingled maybe with some Canaanites that made it to America. You have Mormonism. There's a lot of different things that show like maybe there was this uh, diffusionism of people from Egypt that were kings and Hebrew that made it to the Americas. So that's pretty fascinating. We're going to have to get down yeah, that again. I've not that done is... any work. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. And uh, we have a direct connection between um, the Americas and Egypt with the cocaine mummies. So there was definitely yes, a strong yes, pyramids themselves. Nobody's so, explained that one. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering, do you think the connection between the elongated skulls of Paracas, Peru, and other elongated skulls that have been found around the world, uh, linking this whole lineage to an antediluvian um, race of, of monarchs? Well, yes. I, I don't know if you know, but the Amarna dynasty were cone heads. Oh, yeah. I don't, they had yes. elongated yeah. heads. Never so, have one. Yeah. Um, let me pick up a... 
And Akhenaten, too, was said to An have an image, perhaps. Because this is not very well known that the Amarna dynasty had cone heads. Um, it's busy searching. Let me pick up this image. I don't think you're about finished to song. So if I do a share screen. Hmm. Yeah. Let me expand wow. that a little. Those are some large heads. And you can tell an elongated skull has a larger volume versus the binded skulls, which were made from binding, have a much, much more pointed head. Yeah, on the top left, we have an Amarna princess. So wow. this is said to be Ankesanamun, who is Queen Scota, who went to Scotland. And look at that as a cone head. I mean, that really <laughs> is um, as, as large as any of the Central American ones. What was her name? Ankesanamun. Ankesanamun. And if you look yes. at the Anc coin... Essen Amun. If you look at the coin of well, the guy... Yeah, it almost looks like he has the Amphala stone as his head. Yes, sure. that's exactly what I said as well. Uh, yes. This is the king of Edessa. Um, we'll go into him in a, a later um, talk sometime. Yes. Um, yes, it looks like he's got the Amphala stone on his head, doesn't it? I, yes. It's exactly what I said. It's exactly what I said. Uh, the guy in the top right is Tutankhamun. <laughs> now, he's got a cone head as well. Now, if you look at the um, mummy of Tutankhamun, it's not that pronounced. So he does have a slightly extended head, cranium, but it's not as pronounced as it is in this image, in this sculpture here. <clears throat> so what we're looking at is sculptures. Um, from that era, I mean, these are, not, these are not recent. These are from the uh, actual Amarna era. And bottom left is Nefertiti. Now, obviously, she's got a hat on, but is that hat there to cover her cone head? Because it, she looks like a cone head, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. Whereas the Amana princess above her is just a bare skull. Oh. She doesn't have a hat on at all. But Nefertiti looks exactly the same, and it's covered up with a hat. Isn't that what she's yeah. doing? I don't know. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. So, I, some people still have this feature, and uh, there's a man in the Basque region between Spain and France that has an elongated skull today, to this day. Okay, okay. I've not really looked into this, in, in especially in the modern era, and I've not looked so much into the uh, South American cone heads. But it's interesting that the Amarna dynasty, at the very least, was trying to imitate the cone heads. Um, by exaggerating in their sculpture what they might not have had exactly, you know, physically. So they had moderately extended skulls um, through whatever means that was achieved. But in their art and sculpture, they've exaggerated it greatly because they thought it was important. Mm -hmm. Wow. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. This is a, a great thread, man. Great thread. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you think that these elongated skulls then might have got to Peru? Or this group of these people from Armana? Or were, or were they the only ones with elongated skulls? Or were there others? Because there's also a history of elongated skulls being found in Sardinia. Yeah, well, this, this must be linked with the megalithic era. And I do do some books. We can talk about that later on the megaliths. Okay. Um, because the megalithic era was, again, worldwide. And for no apparent reason, everybody started making, you know, thousand-ton stones and carving them and building them into walls and fortresses and pyramids and temples and God knows what. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, all over the world. Inexplicably, because a lot of these stones are too heavy to manipulate, um, you know, without steel and block and tackle and horses and God knows what. Um, and yet we have this megalithic era all over the world where we have the cone heads all over the world. 
it seems obvious that the, the two go together. You know, mm -hmm. we have the Conehead fraternity, mostly in the royalty, certainly in the aristocracy, um, and the me megalithic era go together. And they were spread around the world in one era by some means or manner. And I talk about that in a book called Thoth, Architect of the Universe. That's another of my books. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, is. Andy, any more questions? Oh, I just wanted to ask about that, and I'm glad he uh, he had something to say about that. So um, if we do another talk, we can definitely go more into that uh, along at his skull aspect. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, we're just starting out our, our year right now with Northern Western Europe and covering Scotland, Ireland, uh, England, the Isles, you know, and kind of uh, going through history uh, through that time period. And we're going to try to be staying on this type of topic for the rest of the year and go into the many different aspects of that region. Uh, so we would absolutely love to have you back, Ralph, to talk about the Holy Grail and the King Arthur mysteries and any more uh, good hot sauce that you got for that. Um, but uh, go ahead and tell the people where they can find your work, pick up your books, uh, any websites you got going on, anything associated with you that you want them to know about. Sure, yes. Um, uh, the books are available in uh, paperback now from Amazon. Uh, I use Amazon because they have this print-on-demand um, facility, which is really good, so I don't have to keep stocks. So they're available in uh, iPad format or paperbacks from Amazon. Um, try to look for the uh, 2017 and later editions. There are still some early editions knocking around. 2017 revised editions are much better. Um, and they've, what I did is I, I put in more uh, images because with print on demand, you can put in as many images as you like and so on. Um, so they are better editions. Um, I've got the YouTube site, YouTube channel, which is, um, I think it's just called Ralph Ellis. But anyway, if you search for Ralph Ellis and come across a thumbnail that's got a, uh, a red and gold uh, image of the phoenix, that will be my thumbnail. So you'll be able to find me there. Um, then I'm on Facebook, which is uh, ralphellis.144 on Facebook. That's fairly busy. I've got quite a lot of um, engagement in, in that. Um, and what else do I have? Well, I've just got various videos knocking around YouTube, I suppose. I've been talking to various people um, on various subjects. So, yeah, do, do have a look at my works. Uh, the books are interesting. They're well documented, a lot of references. All of the references are there. We've been talking about it. Obviously, I can't give um, references out on a just a, a video call or um, podcast or whatever it is. Um, but all the references are there in the books. They're quite large, quite um, quite detailed. I've had to sort of bridge the gap between being too academic and being too um, too undocumented. I mean, mm -hmm. I can tell a story, and then people will say, "Oh, well, where's the references? You know, where's where's the real information, the real data?" Or I could go down the academic route, which is almost unreadable, which I don't like books like that. So I've trod between the two, and I've got books, I think, which are fairly readable, um, yet still have all the references there. Most of the books end up at about 400 pages or so, so they're, they're quite extensive. A um, lot of references, a lot of imagery, <clears throat> so it takes you through the story quite nicely, I think. So Yeah, good stuff, man. This was a great people episode. People tend to appreciate them, I think. I really learned a lot and I appreciate okay. your time and, and coming on to talk about um, the Skoda and all, all this other goodness that you brought to the table. Uh, Indy, uh, where can people go find you at? Uh, if you guys uh, want to yeah. check me out, find me uh, at my blog at vibe tribe scribe dot wordpress dot com and, and Indy Sage. On yeah, and Andy's been with us since uh, the, uh, about 20 minutes into the show. We didn't get to properly introduce him because uh, we were rolling already. But uh, Indy was here with us today. And so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fire Tribe, for listening. And if you're not down with that, wake up.
Oh, big up. <laughs>